Good afternoon, everyone. Mutant Experience Podcast, episode 50. Thank you for choosing to join us on your lazy Sunday afternoon. Today, uh, I have a very special guest. I know I say that all the time on the Mutant Experience Podcast, uh, but this is uh, definitely a a very special occasion uh, because today, on episode 50, of the Moon Experience Podcast. We finally have uh, someone that I've been uh, trying to uh, get on the show uh, for quite some time, Uh, even, you know, right at the very beginning of the, of the, of the podcast, when I first started to do this, uh, I had certain players on my list and uh, I started the podcast maybe three years ago, but anyway, without further ado, before I start rambling on, Today, my special guest for episode 50 of the Mutant Experience podcast, we have none other than the living legend, uh, someone that will go down as probably one of the most notable, famous FGC competitors of all time. We have straight from SoCal, the icon, Mike Watts Watson. Follow this man at Super Dojo Twitter. How's it going, Mike? How have you been uh, lately? Been doing good? Not bad, not bad. Just uh, trying to survive this, uh, you know, coronavirus and pandemic nonsense and mm-hmm. the election and everything, and just keep moving on in life, man. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and turn you up a little bit because I'm not sure if anyone, uh, uh, if, if if people can hear you. Um, but uh, in the chat, for those of you who are in the chat, please uh, let us know how Mike sounds. Let me know how I sound. Make sure that you can hear us all. So, Mike, like I said before. Um, I started the Mutant Experience podcast, I think back in uh, around 2017, 2018, Um, and we have reached 50 episodes. Um, I started the Mutant Experience podcast as a third strike podcast, just as a way to kind of, you know, uh, get to know uh, more people in the third strike scene. And then over time, it kind of turned into this project uh, where, you know, the FGC is getting pretty old. Um, I would say what FGC is about what almost forty years old now. Started what like ninety one, ninety two, something like that. So. Yeah, so it's so it's almost forty years old the FGC, and so then you know I started realizing well you know because of the day because back in the day Mike there was really no way to like record anything aside from footage and and whatnot there was bang the machine and stuff like that but there are a lot of stories that have yet to be told. I always, you know, I always tell people just in passing, like other people that I know in the FGC, especially older players, if, if, if you have a, if you have a desire to tell your story, tell it. I think there should be a lot more podcasts in the FGC. I don't know what you think about that. Mike, there's, but. there's definitely a lot of stories to be told. It's just, uh, you know, you just don't want to look like the crazy grandpa telling his war stories over and over. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm just sitting there out of respect listening, but there, there's a lot of interesting stories. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, might be shocking to the kids of kids of the newer age, you know, the internet age, but mm-hmm. fights did exist, you know, there was real rivalries, there was heated rivalries, it wasn't always uh you know, rainbows and unicorns like uh, like it turned out. So And I think we're gonna amazing. And I think we're gonna get through a lot of uh get through a lot of that uh during today's show. Um because you're you're you know, uh w- whether anyone likes to admit it or not, Mike, you are a integral part of the american third strike history uh yeah. you were there from the very beginning you were there before third strike even came out um you are quite possibly you know one of the more successful american third strike competitors in evolution history um and we're gonna get to that obviously later in the show but let's let's start at the beginning mike because um for for the, for for those of you uh, who are listening right now that that may not be aware. Um, I know that I shared this story uh, numerous times, not just on my show, uh, but on the Match Arena podcast. Um, but I grew up in Southern California. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I spent most of my childhood in a small suburban town uh, about, what would you say, 25 miles uh, east of, of, of Los Angeles, maybe? 20 miles no, no, no. around there? Maybe less than that? Maybe less than that? Yeah, um, I think maybe I'm thinking about 20 minutes, 
<laughs> outside of LA with no traffic, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah, LA traffic is worse than people can ever imagine. Um, but for 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 those of you who don't who don't um who who aren't uh, aware, uh, I grew up in SoCal. I grew up, in fact, in a in a town called Monterey Park, uh, and. I, I, just as it just as it so happens, uh, Watts, you also uh, know Monterey Park very well. Yeah, um, I, I lived there for about twenty five years. Yeah, and so interestingly enough, we we kind of grew up in the same area. Um, you were just a little bit older than me, but you know, growing up, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show is because I kind of wanted to, because, you know, I, I, I moved to Monterey Park, you know, if you had to pin down a year, I would say I moved to Monterey Park around 1987, Okay. 1988. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I, I was born in the Philippines, moved to Long Beach, uh, went to kindergarten and first grade there. <laughs> and then I, I moved to uh, uh, Monterey Park uh, around 1987. So, were you born and raised in Monterey Park, Mike? Oh, actually, so this is kind of weird. I was <laughs> born in Japan because my father was in the military. Okay, so you were born in Japan. That was sick. Yeah, I was born in Okinawa. Wow. And, uh, I came here when I don't know, maybe I was like three months old, and we moved mm -hmm. to a uh, a place called Upland, which is mm -hmm. uh, if people know the area, it's in maybe. 30 miles east of uh, east of Los Angeles, and I was uh, I was brought up in Upland until I was maybe 11 or 12 years old. So then I moved out to Monterey Park, Alhambra area, same time around you, like 88, 89. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm still in the general area, but I, uh, I I lived in the same home for about 25 years in Monterey Park. So yeah, I've been out here just just as long as you, but I do have a few more years on you, so. Mm -hmm. So for, for our viewers who are unfamiliar with, with, with Monterey Park and SoCal in general, how would you describe Monterey Park to people who have never been there? The fact that stands out, this is a true fact, Monterey Park has the highest concentration of Asians outside of China. This is, a, this is an actual fact here. And uh, if you like Chinese food, if you like you know, the Asian culture, Monterey Park, Anywhere in the San Gabriel Valley, but Monterey Park specifically, it, it'll suit all your needs to, to satisfy your little Chinese or Asian bitch. <laughs> now, you know, for anyone that judges a book by its cover, they might look at you, Mike, and go, well, you know, you don't seem very Asian. But as a matter of fact, you're probably more Chinese than I am. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your, 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 your ethnic background. Okay, so my dad is just straight up white boy, right? But my mom is a... <laughs> My mom is full Chinese, so I am 50% Chinese. I speak, uh, I speak fluent Cantonese, which has got me into a lot of trouble, which we can uh, get, get, um, get into a little bit later, talking about, you know, just playing Street Fighter in general and stuff. I was always looked at, like, you know, the Mexican kid, because, you know, a white guy with black hair. Even though you weren't Mexican at all, right? Like, right I, have, you know, I have zero Latino blood in me at all. <laughs> Because when I first met you, I mean, I, I just assumed, or when I first started seeing pictures of you in gaming magazines, I just assumed that you were probably, you know, <laughs> you were probably some sort of Hispanic or, or whatever. And it probably didn't help that I tried to grow a mustache when I was a kid, because, you know, when you're a kid, you try to look older than you really are just to be cool, you know? So <laughs> that, probably, mm -hmm. that probably threw it into a little bit of a, a guessing game for people. Mm hmm you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about, Mike, is growing up in Monterey Park. Like you mentioned before, uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, the highest concentration of, of Asians, um, a, a very high concentration of Chinese people. Um, Monterey Park in the 80s, when you and I grew up, uh, was a place uh, that was, again, heavily concentrated as far as Chinese people, Asian people. Um, the stores, the awnings, they were in Chinese right the restaurants yeah. the supermarkets um but we were just talking about this last night when we were uh preparing for the podcast as a kid monterey park may have seemed a, a little bit quiet a little bit slow a little bit boring but looking back on it now that we're adults monterey park was a really nice place to live it seems i mean did, were you aware of that when you were growing up or not really um you know I grew up in Upland. It was mostly uh, uh -huh. generally, you know, like a Caucasian area. 
And I, I was getting fights like literally every week due to racism back then. It was, it was crazy. So when I moved to Monterey Park, it was kind of weird. Like uh, I was kind of kind of being shit on in the Upland for being white or for being Asian, and then I move mm-hmm. up to Monterey Park and I'm getting shit on for being white now. And it was like a total <laughs> like flip of the scene. So it was kind of a weird thing, but but for the most part, it, it was a it was a nice area. It was a really nice area. Um, education level made a difference. The schools were definitely better. The public school system was a lot better in the area. Um, <laughs> the, the, the parenting, you know, all my friends, their parents forced them to go to college and they made sure they, they had all the tools and everything. So they, you know, they immigrated here, which, uh, you know, gave us, they, they had a sense of entitlement, I guess is, is the best way to put it. So they fought for everything. They tried to give their children the best that they created. Mm-hmm. Get more, uh, not obedient, but uh, disciplined, I guess. So you have, a, you have people that want to go somewhere from the city. It wasn't just people just living just to live and just following their parents. Their parents pushed them hard, so it, it made the children a lot better, and it made them they're, they're more goal oriented. So just growing up over here, you just felt the you felt a little bit of pressure going to school. For sure, the students were always trying to you don't get a. Your mom gets mad. You get a B. You literally get hit by a, by a feather duster when you come home. You know that was the that was the culture growing up. So I think things were a lot different back then. But it's it's it was a nice place to grow up. That's for sure. But like I said, just the education level and the goal orientation it, it makes for a better a better surrounding and definitely pushes you to be better and to better yourself. And so, what what elementary school did you go to, Watts? I actually went to the Margarita Elementary School in Alhambra. Uh-huh. I lived in Monterey Park, and I didn't want to transfer schools. Then I went to Alhambra High, but I got kicked out of Alhambra High because I ditched too much school playing Street Fighter, and I got caught writing my own notes. And my parents did not want to cover for me anymore, so they just said, "You know what? You're going to eat it this time." So I wound up going to Alhambra, getting kicked out. Independent studies for half of my sophomore year. I couldn't go to Mark Keppel due to gang activity. So I probably would have been killed at Mark Keppel. And I went to Rosemead for my junior year. And I don't know how. I got kicked out of Rosemead, too, for some reason. <laughs> and then I went back to Alhambra for my senior year, which was awesome because I got to reunite with all my friends and stuff. But mm-hmm. Yeah, Street Fighter, uh, Street Fighter played a big role in, uh, in, my, in my younger days of schooling. So, mm-hmm. Well, let's get back to that. So how did you get into, um, you know, again, you and I had the luxury, I guess you could call it, to, to grow up in in, in, in in an era where there were still many arcades uh, to, to go to as a kid, especially, you know, for people who were interested in playing Street Fighter. But, you know, in, in, in that early 90s, really all the way up through the 90s, um, Monterey Park and the San Gabriel Valley in general had a, a, a plethora of, of, of arcades. Right. Um, you know, like, it's just so sad... Yeah. I know, you know, we're going to get to this, you know, in a, you know, later in the podcast when we talk about your efforts to revive Super Arcade. But I can still remember a time, right? Again, not to sound like the old grandpa telling war stories, but you remember a time when, you know, like Friday night or Saturday night or whatever night you would go to and like your friends had to, ch- your, your friends had to, de- like you and your friends had to decide which arcade to go to, right? Yeah, remember, remember that time <laughs> where we had to. But also remember, you can go to any 7-Eleven back then, and you would yeah. have you wouldn't have to shit. You'd have good competition mm-hmm. in Street Fighter at any 7-Eleven you go to. Like, I don't know if you ever like ventured up Garfield into Alhambra past Valley. There was a 7-Eleven up there, and that was known for Street Fighter over there. Like, you could literally before going to the arcade, you want to buy some drinks or some snacks, you could mm-hmm. get some free Street Fighter, Street Fighter, and just at your local, you know, 7-Eleven. It was it was really cool back then, man. Like. The game was yeah. so crazy. It was just, it wasn't, it was everywhere. It was just everywhere. Is that how you got into Street Fighter? Just, you know, with the luxury of being in an area where like arcades were just everywhere? Or, you know, how did, how did Street Fighter come into play for you or, or video games in general? So there was a place, uh, you know, very well. It's called Pirates Cove. It's in, uh, mm-hmm. it was in Water Park. In that same shopping mall, there was NBC Seafood, which still exists. And, you know, being Chinese, you know, all the, all your family wants to gather on the weekend and go get some dim sum and 
Of course, they take two hours sipping on their tea and eating all slow and everything. So you're like, <laughs> hey, I'm going to go to the arcade. I'll be back. And then one day I just went over there and, dude, Street Fighter was there. And it's like, dude, what, what is this? It's like six buttons and it's two player. And it's like, dude, it's just something no one's ever seen before. Just crazy. And I don't even remember how old I was. I, we're just, dude, we're just playing Street Fighter. Like, just because our parents went to go get in someone we got bored. And I don't know exactly what the year was but we were playing and then they they had the big button street fighter at the mall i don't know if you ever ventured to the montebello mall when you were younger but they had a timeout at the mall they had the big street fighter there with two two big ass buttons and i don't know like just things just progress and progress and it was even competitive back then just playing the old street fighter not even street fighter 2 street fighter just one so it, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. There was a lot of competition, even even on a game that nobody even really knew how to play it. There was still competition, so it was it was so innovative and exciting back then. Yeah, so I think Street Fighter. I think Street Fighter One came out in '87, um, and you know, uh, 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 and for those of you who are unfamiliar with Pirates Cove, Pirates Cove uh, was an arcade in Monterey Park, and it was located in a strip mall. That you know, and in the strip mall. That was the restaurant you're referring to. There was a movie theater as well in the same strip mall. Um, I think it right. turned into a discount movie theater later on when times were getting tough. <laughs> but but that area, that that strip mall was was really lively when I was a kid growing up. There was so much stuff going on. And uh, Pirates Cove, uh, the first time I ventured into Pirates Cove um, was probably around the time that street fighter ce came out you know oh. but but really the, the the place where i remember the most growing up playing street fighter 2 was the montebello mall i i actually don't even remember what the name of the arcade in the montebello mall was it was called Time Out. is that yeah. what it was called oh. I, I don't even as a kid i went there all the time every weekend i would walk there with my best friend marvin mr universe we would walk right. to montebello mall um, and then we would we would see everyone playing uh, on uh, Street Fighter Two. That's where uh, you know I, I probably don't remember seeing you there, but you know that's where I first kind of saw people playing competitively. Um, I saw you know the the, the Gaio handcuff tricks and the shadow throws, <laughs> and you know what was really cool about and I wanted to get your opinion on this, Watts. Um, when we look at Third Strike history. From the beginning to, to to now, you know, one of the things you know that we constantly, you know, have uh, sort of discussed uh, are 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 ports. You know what I mean, like like console ports and stuff like that. Right. But I remember when I got Street Fighter Two for SNES finally, right? Like it only made me want to go to the arcade more because it was like, wow, so I can practice on the SNES. I mean, you know, you were a little kid, you didn't know like the differences right but like just as a kid right like as like a as a, as a 10 year old kid you know you, you you get this game and it's at home and you're like oh now i can practice and then i can go to the arcade and, and, and play um but anyway but now it's kind of like different now it's weird because it was like console made you want to go to the arcade to play street fighter mm -hmm. at least from, from from my vantage point so so how did how did how did street fighter 2 come into play i mean you started with street fighter 1 but did was Street Fighter Two something that you were just kind of waiting for? Did you know that it was coming out, or was it no just... one? No one really knew it was coming out. But uh, mm -hmm. we've talked about this before. There was a place called V Games that was mm -hmm. local to us, and they were they're an import, you know, Asian video game shop, and they had the latest like stuff all the time, right? And I don't know if you remember, but they actually had a super gun back then, like before anybody had it, and. Really? We, would, we would go to like house parties and stuff in high school and people would rent this super gun and i think it was it was like a hundred bucks right for like two nights or something like that and when you're when you're 14 13 14 years old a hundred bucks is dude that's just an, that's a lot of money <laughs> that's a huge amount of money but the thing is they would rent these super guns and you would have to get your older brothers or whatever someone with the driver's license to rent a credit card and all that and we would rent it from the two old ladies at V-Games and bring it to the party. And, dude, it was, like, just the coolest shit, dude. Like, Street Fighter 2 was... And it was the arcade version. It wasn't no bullshit console version. It was a legit super gun that you took home and connected to. It was, like, it was just amazing, man. Like, 
and people know I fucking hate console, right? I hate console adaptation of arcade games. I hate it when Evil went to console because I've been competing on arcades for, you know, 20 years. And to ask me to play a version of a game that I'm used to and then go to, like, something, even the slightest difference, it makes all the difference in the world. And it was just it was a tough transition. It was hard to accept, but obviously the accessibility and the, the convenience and just the... Just the growth of the, the community in general and the game in general, it's like you really have no choice. But it was something that I had a really hard time letting go of arcades because, I mean, dude, we grew up in the arcade era. It's hard, to, it's hard to really realize, like, okay, this is a, this is a business model that's no longer going to be here. And you, you really have no choice if you want to keep competing. And if this is something you really love, you really have to just, just let it go and just, just go with the flow, I guess. Yeah. So how how did you gain your reputation as as a Street Fighter competitor? Because uh, I remember recently, I think it's in the last couple of years, you actually appeared in a uh, short uh, documentary uh, on you know the uh, on a player that you're probably very well familiar with, right? And of course, I'm talking about Tomo Ohira. There was a documentary oh. that, that that was put out recently, kind of revisiting where he is and how he you know and how he made a name for himself in the street fighter scene and so how did that happen how did that come about for you like where did you where did you how did you develop this reputation as because in, like when you came up right there wasn't really anything called fgc right like do you even remember sort of around the time when like people started calling it the fgc like like because you were didn't really start up until probably after like b b3 b4 uh -huh. somewhere around there, like in the late like Late nineties, uh -huh. there was no, there was no one really called the FGC. It was just like a bunch of friends gathering or your rivals or whatever. Uh -huh. But let me get into a little bit of beef. Let me let okay. me let me sidetrack a little bit. There's okay. There's a beef with that fucking documentary that was made, right? Like Tomo is my homie, right? Like uh -huh. we've we've been competitors, we've been friends for a long, long fucking time, and I have no problem, no problem hyping this guy up, and I have no problem saying this is the best player. Ever, right? Like, I can genuinely say he's the best player fucking ever. Like, no one will top that. It's like it's like the Michael Jordan discussion, right? You're never going to play him, but in his prime, everybody that played against him will, will, will confess to it. He's the best fucking player ever. I have no problem putting him on a pedestal. I have no problem, you know, giving him his props and everything. But that fucking documentary, dude, let me tell you, dude, supposedly okay. it was connected with the people, some guys at CNN and and whatnot, and they fucking wasted two days of my goddamn time, right? They were like, hey, we're going to talk about the top three guys in the old school days. It's going to be Tomo, Jeff Schaefer, and myself, right? Mm -hmm. They never fucking told me, hey, this is a fucking Tomo here, a dick-sucking video where you're going to fucking hype this guy up and you're going to fucking kiss his ass and make him look like the best and everything. Had they told me that, I would have zero problem. Like, dude, I would have hyped them up even more. But they fucking, dude, that's why I hate, I hate media. I hate people coming in that don't know shit about the scene that make money off the scene. I hate people that want to do like, like interviews with the players. Like, you're a competitor. You know us, we're cool. You were actually involved with the scene and you were heavily involved. But then you got all these Joe Schmoes trying to come in and just make a quick buck off the scene and trying to get some some notice because they wrote an article about something that they don't know shit about you know it's like it's like telling me and you to go to like an underground like rap hip-hop and shit and write about it we know the music right we know a little bit they just like they heard of street fight and they've seen it but we really don't know shit about that stuff right so these people aren't qualified and they're do they're doing shit and it kind of puts the the fgc in a bad light because they're not promoting it and how would you say it? they're doing it for the wrong reasons? I guess I would say, and they don't have a true love for it like you and I do. So that kind of that that interview really it chapped my hide. You know, I was kind of pissed off for a long time about that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but yeah, going back to that. Uh, well, it sounds like well, you know, let, let, let's stick to that because I think it's important what you talked about, Watts. So it sounds like they kind of misled you. You're saying oh, big time, dude, man. Fuck CNN and fuck the guy who made the <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, obviously the scale is different, but um, growing up in SoCal, it's not surprising that I grew up a huge Lakers fan. I'm, to this day, I'm still a big uh, pro basketball fan. And, 
you know, going back to my point earlier about, you know, people in the FGC starting their own podcasts, that's kind of what the NBA did, right? Like players were just tired of the media um, being in control of all the narratives. And so what did all the NBA players started doing? They started putting out their own podcasts and, and, and telling their own side of the story. So I think, you know, it, it, it makes me think about that when you, you know, uh, you know, the fact that you just shared that story, you know, it is, it is tough, right? Like even within the FGC, Mike, like I feel weird talking about other scenes, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's like, I don't know shit about the ST scene. I don't know shit about the CVS. I mean, like maybe I do more than the, you know, more than someone outside the FGC. Yeah. <laughs> At least you were there, right? Yeah. You were watching the fucking top people all the time. You were just surrounded by players. You actually had interactions with Justin. You know, it's a different game. You know, it's a common word. Like they say, they're working like, on Tom Brady's game when they don't even, they've never thrown football in their life. It's like, that, that, that actually really, it, it hurts me, you know, like, and the, like, they don't grounds to be there and that's why like i've been asked for like quite a few interviews like over the past year and stuff after super closed down and i guess I, i've turned down a lot of people dude i've turned down a lot of people just because i got tired of hey i can come out here and tell these stories myself free of charge or i could tell my story and let this guy interpret it incorrectly and it comes out wrong and we get a bad view on fpc fuck it i'll just tell it myself people hear it for what it is and it's the truth, right? It's coming straight from the horse's mouth. There's no filter. There's nothing. There's no there's no idiot in between trying to make two dollars off of it. I don't need to fucking say anything or be politically correct, you know? I can sit here and say fuck wizard all I want and <laughs> nothing will come out of it, you know? Like that's just that's how it should be. hmm So going back to the topic of, of you coming up in, in Street Fighter, you know, how did that how did that come about for you? Um, you know, like exactly how did you build that reputation? Where did you play, you know, and, 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 and was, were there any players back in the day that kind of, cause you know, when you came up, it was pretty cutthroat, right? Like there weren't any, there, there wasn't necessarily anyone putting their arm around your shoulder and going, you know, you should probably stop mashing that button or you should, you probably shouldn't, maybe you should try this move or that move. Like there was none of that, right? Or at least very little of that. It was so, like, rude. how did you? So how did you come up and how did you, you know, sort of become that, that, you know, that fierce competitor that everyone knows now? Okay, so I was very lucky. Like, uh, during the Street Fighter 2 days, which is when I got a when I was a freshman in high school, there was a guy who was number four in, uh, in the rankings for Street Fighter. There was actual rankings at a place called World's Finest Comics. Mm-hmm. And he was number four there. And then I was playing him, and then it, it got to a point where I was getting better than him. And then he was just like, dude, he was getting mad. Like, he's a super, super, like, tough competitor. And uh, he he was friends with Tomo. And he took me to a tournament one day. So this is when Champion, when Champion came out is when I entered my first tournament at World's Finest Comics. And somehow I managed to get through the entire bracket. And I played Tomo. And I took a set off him. And at this time... Like, no one's even beating this guy. Like, even you take a game off him, and you're just like, you're like, oh, shit, this guy's amazing, right? Dude, I took a set off him. We went to grand finals. And it, I don't think it went to the last game. It was like 4-1 or 4-2 in the last set, the final, final set, and he won. But I got noticed, like, right away right there because I got second place in what's arguably the strongest competition back at that time at World Finest, which was located in uh, Whittier, California. And... Uh, this place was run by a gentleman by the name of Charles Franco, who was Tomo's manager back then. Uh, he's the owner of the shop, and he set up a, what, what was it called? The, the California Association for Street Fighters? Something like, something to that extent. And there was a rank chart and everything, and if you go back to, if you're familiar with GamePro Magazine and stuff like that, it was, he was one of the writers for GamePro. He was hired as a writer, and they would have a section for him, and there's some articles on me. There's some articles on Tomo, and it shows the rankings in the background. And you know, like you, you were real proud just to get your name on the board. And dude, like I got my name on the board. And dude, I was just I was there. And then so then there's this guy. He was like a top player before I was I was coming around. His name is Tony. He was a Taiwanese kid, like a 
I don't know, he was like in med school or something. But I remember beating him in the tournament and he was pretty pissed about it. Because, you know, I'm like some young kid. I'm like 14 and this kid's, you know, like 19 years old and he was hot shit. You know, he's like top two, top three at the time. So I remember there was a rule. If you have your name on the board, the person under you can challenge you. And you're forced to show up within a week or you lose your ranking. And he was so adamant about fucking challenging me. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm a kid, bro. I don't have a ride. He's like, I'll come pick you up. I don't give a fuck. And like, fuck it then. And then he, I remember he picked me up. And then we, he drove me to a world's finest. And Charles was there to be the referee for everything. And I kicked his ass again, right? I just fucked this shit up. And I was just talking so much shit, right? At this point, I'm just like, dude, I was known as the biggest shit talker. And I, I don't want to take full credit for it, but I'm pretty sure I'm the biggest asshole that started the whole, like, doing all these throws in tournament just to be a dick, you know? Like, like you know, back then it's honorable when you're playing, right? If you go to a 7-Eleven you start throwing someone around, you're getting in a fist fight for throwing people in Street Fighter back in the day. But in tournament, anything goes. And I took it to my advantage that I would just throw them around. I literally wanted – I didn't – I didn't per se want to start a fight, but I wanted to piss them off because I noticed as a kid when you piss someone off, it throws them off their game. So I used that to my advantage for like my whole career. I would always talk shit. And I would always get in people's head. And it just led to like, oh, this guy's a fucking big mouth and everybody wanted to kill me. And before the match even started, if they were mad, like you already know, like I got him. It's over. Like he's in, he's in my back pocket. You know, like this guy's so pissed off, he's going to try to do everything he can to kill me and I'll just play my game. and. He's not even like halfway into the game. He just wants to fight me at this point. He just totally take advantage of it. And dude, it just just me throwing people around, me talking shit, and it just created kind of like this lore, like, oh, it's this asshole kid Watson. He just came on the scene, he's fucking got a big mouth and everyone wants to kill him and it just it just blew up from there, man. You're, you're you're probably one of the you know one of the very first um smack talkers in the fgc um but when you were coming up were, were there other people that were like that that talk smack or like like where did that come from you know did it you know, where, where did that competitiveness come from? Because one of the things that, you know, I'm going to always remember you for is just how fiercely competitive you were, right? You hate, you hated losing. Like, and, 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 and it wasn't enough for you to beat your opponent. You had to, like, embarrass them. You had to, like, yeah. make them feel helpless. You had to make them feel like, wow, there's no way I'm beating this guy. Like, mm -hmm. where did that come from, would you say? So, I think when, uh, when I was younger, I used to compete in sports a lot and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, dude, I'm 5'8", right? And in high school, I was like, dude, like 5'3", five, 5'4", five, but I was still playing basketball. And then, fuck, man, you got these fucking, you got these guys that are, like, just, like, prospects, you know, for for college and stuff. And, dude, these these guys are, like, dunking already in high school, you know? And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> man, I don't compete with this shit. So you just, dude, you, you really got to, it's like John Stockton, dude, you fucking, like, you know, you elbow him when you go inside of him, you charlie him when you're running around fucking picks, and you just got to, you got to find whatever you can, and like, dude, my mouth was my my biggest weapon back then, right? Because there's only so much you can do when the guy's, like, fucking six feet tall and he can swat everything. You got no choice, man. You got to fucking, you know, hit him in the gut. You got to go go around him, you know. You got to talk shit to him. You got to distract him. It's just you got to use whatever tools you can. And, dude, I mean, like I said, at an early age, I figured out. You just throw someone off their game, and it's totally your advantage. And another thing is I also noticed when I got pissed off, it was different than when they get pissed off. Though when I got pissed off, I got really focused and I wanted to win even more. And there, there's a couple of there's a couple of events that happened in the history of Street Fighter that we can get into a little bit later. But people really talk shit and it really pissed me off. And there were the forums, and forums were a brand new thing back then. And people would talk shit on the forums, and I would use that as like all my fuel when I go to the next tournament. Like, like I really hated Third Strike, right? I'll be honest, I hated this fucking game, but I love the competition so much. And I never really learned how to play Third Strike. I was playing Street Fighter. I was playing Third Strike. I was playing Street Fighter the whole time I was playing that game. And I dumbed the game down, and I made it where they're playing my game. So 
there was players like uh, like the Family Fun crew, right? Like, I don't want to turn this into you know fuck Family Fun type of podcast or anything, but those guys, those fucking guys, they really thought they were on another level. I remember them specifically calling all the outsiders Mongolians and this and that. But the stupid thing about that was they didn't realize the Mongolians fucking destroyed everybody. So whatever wall they wanted to build up, Genghis Khan would fucking just come and fucking take it down whenever he wanted. So I don't know why they thought so highly of themselves. But yeah, man, just just getting pissed off just, I don't know, man, brought me to another level. And there was there was a lot of instances, dude. There was a lot of instances where where I brought brought a fire with me and that, that's all I needed. I had to motivate myself, you know. It's kind of like, kind of like these guys slap themselves in the face before, before a football game, or you know, they get riled up. They look at like a picture of their enemy, and they're like, "Yeah, they're ready to fucking kill somebody." And like, yeah, for some reason, that just when I got pumped up, and I, I would, I would come and I'll bring my A game after that time. Mm-hmm. So, for the viewers who um, maybe you know too young to have um remembered uh you know the arcade scene um and, and we're talking you know like hyper fighting era right or, or or ce era okay what was what was like a typical tournament like back in the day because you know even me right you know i started going to tournaments around 2003 so that was already way later than like you had already been going to tournaments for for 10 years over 10 years by that time right but but what was like what was like an early '90s, like let's say hyper fighting or or CE era? What was like a what was like a typical tournament, like like a big tournament? So I try not to be too biased. Mm-hmm. I can, I think the best comparison I can make is like a Super Turbo tournament because Super Turbo is still played to this day and is played at a very high level. Mm-hmm. I truly believe the top four of Super Turbo team back then can get top eight at Evo, no problem, like, up to this day. Mm. And who, are the, who, are those, who, who are those players you would? Oh, like, uh, Tomo, we can consider Tomo, even though he kind of quit in Super, he would have played Super Turbo, he would have had no problem getting top four. Uh, myself, Jeff Schaefer, a uh, guy named George No. Uh, there's another guy named Norm Ho, who actually came around to play, I don't, I want to say not too long ago, but it was 10 years, he would come to some of the Cal Poly tournaments and stuff. Mm-hmm. play super Turbo and he he win if i didn't enter or even if i did he might beat me but he, he won a couple of those tournaments i believe um who else was there? there's a guy named frank quang there's there's a bob painter who's still around who still competes who's still pretty darn good uh bob painter had a friend named james romedy who was really good these guys came from san diego these guys came from san diego to come to our tournament that happened every three weeks at world's finest Mm-hmm. I'm saying like the, the top eight back at world's finest could easily compete in today's scene, like very easily. And I don't say that just because, you know, I'm from that time, but if you look at it, I, I can still compete and I can still pretty much be not consistently, but I, I can beat and I can hang with any of the top players in super turbo nowadays too. So I firmly believe that like if Jeff Schaefer went to Evo during his prime, I, I firmly believe he would like win super turbo if, if he really wanted to. Like, that's how good some of the players, and it's not to knock the newer players, but back then, the players that played the game were actual college students and whatnot, so their brains, they're, they're a little bit older than the crowds that start now, right? You got, like, kids that are, like, 15, 16. These guys are, like, 22, 24 college students, you know, like, obviously, they're smarter than your average person, so they, they were they were good players. They were definitely good players. Um, uh, Execution, I believe execution better is now because uh, you have all the tools. You can go to training mode, stuff like that. But you got you to gotta realize also back then we didn't have any shared information. So there's no just, oh, let me watch YouTube and check this match. We were learning a lot from I think players are active, the newer players nowadays. But like I said, it's not to knock the new players. The new players, they have the execution advantage. They have a, they have a lot of frame data. They know perfect perfect counters, perfect recovery time on everything. They just know exactly what to do at the exact, at the exact time. But I think the innovation back, back in the early days, I think the innovation and creativity was a huge factor. So uh, it, it's a rough thing. But like I said, those, those top players back then, I think they can nowadays if, if they kept playing or 
at that level that they fought. Like, if you could kind of time warp 20 years into the future and bring them to evil, they would have been able to, to do some of this. Look at John Choi. John Choi's from back in the day. He still does awesome at Super Turbo tournaments, right? Like, and this guy doesn't even practice. So it's just going off game knowledge and whatnot. And you still got by it, even though he's like one generation after. But yeah, the older guys, they're, they're pretty smart, I, I would say. And like I said, they're, they're all college students. They're all older guys back then already. So I think just the mental development and just the understanding of things is a lot, a lot easier when you're 22 compared to when you're 16 or 17. So <clears throat> one thing that I've mentioned... In, in previous podcasts, and I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, Mike. I, I probably have, but and again, our our opinions can differ. Um, you know, I, I'm of the belief. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this podcast if I didn't. But I'm of the belief that Third Strike is 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 is, is the best Street Fighter game ever made. Right? I know that you, you have your own opinions with that, but but my favorite Street Fighter game, right. the one that like is close to my heart, is Hyper Fighting, because like I had mentioned before, that was kind of around when, around when hyper fighting came out like around when the rainbow edition came out that's when i really started to like play street fighter um or when uh-huh. i started to really discover street fighter and when me and my friends would go like i said like we mentioned to like random laundromats um liquor stores but they were called they're called bodegas in new york of course we called them liquor stores <laughs> yeah uh, in, in socal um i remember the the ymca next to Meyer library i think they had a street fighter machine in there they did for a time yes they did That's yeah <laughs> um and so do you have any um sort of memorable stories about you know the tournaments during that era like like, 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 what are some tournaments that kind of tournament performances that stand out in your mind? Because from that era, there was, there's so very few documented results, right? Of, of, and, and, and beyond that, there's really no, there was really no reporting. So really, you know, the only way that we can know what it was like back in those days is, is, is through, you know, the, the things that players like you and Tomo remember. And so, you know, do you have any like specific tournament memories? Uh, that, that 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 stick out in your mind from that era, like say like 1990s, like early 90s. I have one real fond fond memory of a tournament I won. Okay. And believe it or not, it was at V Games. Mm-hmm. It was a Champion Edition. Mm-hmm. So you know, like V Games didn't throw too many tournaments, and this is in home court, right? And I don't want to lose in home court. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sorry beforehand. I don't mean to shit on this person. I'm really cool with this person nowadays, but back then there was a huge beef. So Tomo came down to this tournament. And mind you, me and Tomo used to split every tournament that wasn't at World's Finest. Okay. Mm-hmm. Outside of World's Finest, we would split every tournament. There was a family fun tournament that happened every three weeks. There was like random donut shop tournaments with like hundred dollar guarantee pots and stuff like that. We would split these tournaments we went to together. But this tournament, Tomo came with his manager. I don't know why, okay? I have no idea. And me and his manager did not get along whatsoever back then. Like, there was a genuine hate between both of us. And mind you, this guy's like, how much older than me? I want to say he's probably like seven or eight years older than me, and he's a bodybuilder. Okay, so let's go fuck around. This guy's like, this guy's like, I don't know, five, five, nine or something like that. And he was like a good solid, like 200 pounds of muscle. So he's not someone you want to. With. But I don't know why, dude. I just had this huge beef with him because I'm the only guy that could really give Tomo a run for his money back then. So they come to the tournament, and then it winds up. They made the brackets, okay? It's just, I'm pretty sure they made the fucking brackets. But regardless, so I'm on the same side as Tomo in the bracket, even though we're number one and number two. Charles is on the other side. Okay, so we get to the win- uh, not winners final. We get to the semifinals. Charles wins his match, so now he's sitting in grand finals, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on. I take that back. We're sitting in final four. Me and Tomo and Charles versus someone else. So Charles wins his match, so now he's sitting there. And then uh, Tomo plays me, and Tomo beats me. So I'm like, fuck, right? I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm going to wind up getting third. This is crap. I know they're going to rig some shit. So Charles asked Tomo, hey, let me win so I go to the grand finals and just wait for you to beat Mike again to go to fucking, and then me and you will split first and second place money. 
And then I, I, I distinctly remember someone like, I don't know, man, Mike's a little bit dangerous, dude. Maybe we should just play for real. That way, if Mike meets me in grand finals, he has to beat me two sets. So I have some insurance. Mm-hmm. And Charles like hyping up, nah, man, you're the best, blah, blah, blah. Mike like, can't fucking beat you. And, oh, dude, like, like I told you before, just hearing shit talk and getting my blood boiling was like, that's a big mistake, dude. You don't want to piss me off when I play games. So it winds up I have to play a few more matches. Tomo lets Charles win, so he's sitting pretty in the winner's bracket, and Tomo's sitting in loser's finals waiting for the, the next guy. I get to loser's finals. I beat Tomo, right? And back then, it's not very common. I'll beat Tomo, like, 25%, maybe 30%, like, which is not, not, a good, not a good ratio. But that 30% is more than everyone else. So I wind up beating him, and I get to grand finals. And I'm playing Charles, and I'm just like, you're so fucked. And I'm just talking nonstop shit. I'm like, you're so fucked, bro. You guys pulled this stupid shit in my town. You thought you could come to fucking my town and win? This is Monterey Park, bitch. This is my fuck. So you don't come here and fuck with me. So you ain't shit. I go, this is the stupidest shit I've ever seen anyone do. You're your manager? You're his manager? You're going to put him in a position to look like, dude, it was just nonstop, nonstop. And this guy's fuming, man. He just fucking... I can smell it, like, and I'm not even scared. Like, if this guy wanted to hit me, it will knock me the fuck out back then, like, but. My apologies, guys. We're uh, running into some uh, technical difficulties. It looks like Watts' camera uh, went out here. Uh, we should get him back soon. There you go. Go ahead, Watts. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. See, the shit talk is so strong that it disconnects mm-hmm. Fucking internet, dude. That's how strong it is, bro. <laughs> it's too powerful. Yeah, man. That's probably one of my fondest memories as a kid because I really, really pissed this guy off. Like, I knew, I knew that would fucking bother him forever. You can't just ask for a whip and then you don't fucking hear it, you know? Like, and he put his boy in a position, even though he was uncomfortable, he just did it because we we're kids, you know? We we're like 14 years old, man. We're going to listen to an older guy. Because supposedly they know better, right? But, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a cool victory, man. Winning it in hometown, shitting on both of them. I didn't really talk too much shit to Tomo because it wasn't his fault. But yeah, it was just that was that was a really satisfying victory at that point. Mm-hmm. So let's let's fast forward a little bit to you know say around I would say ninety three. Oh, by the way, so obviously. Uh, Hyperfining comes out in 92. Uh, and then a year later, the, the CPS2 system debuts. Um, uh, true story, the first time I saw Super New Challengers was at V Games. Uh, I think it might have been the day that it came out because I remember Marvin and I, after school, we had heard about the new Street Fighter, Super Street Fighter 2. And I think one day after school, we rushed to V Games. Um, I think it was about like, usually it's about like a 10 minute walk from, from Repetto, which is where we were going, right? Um, Repetto elementary school. Um, um, and it's, it's a little bit further walk. Like, I think we were, I'm trying to think, I, I think I was still in eighth grade in Repetto when super street fighter came out. So I went to V game, we went straight to V games and there was this huge crowd. And so again, for, for people who are unfamiliar with V games, I mean, this is a pretty small store, right? Mike, it's not like a big Uh, store at all. I'd say what, like 400 square feet, something like that. Yeah. About for even, you know, around that 400, 500 square feet. And then, and then they had that one cab, the blue cab, right? There was a, there's an American cab and it had new challengers. And what, what were your, I, I don't know if you ever shared this in other interviews or podcasts, Mike, but but what were your thoughts on 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 new challengers? Because, like I said before, you know the the Street Fighter game that's close to my heart, and I know it's also a, a favorite. It's the favorite Street Fighter of Riz One. I see you in the chat, Riz. <laughs> that's an inside joke. Um, but Hyper Fighting is my favorite game, right? It's it's kind of the game that's close to my heart, and like. And then we get to new challengers and like the first thing I noticed, I mean, obviously the graphics were really nice and stuff, but right. like the first thing I noticed was like, why is this game as slow as shit? Like, why is it so slow? Like did, did, did that kind of like, what was your reaction to new challengers? So I was like, all right, I'm going to pick Kyle, right? Cause mm-hmm. Kyle doesn't have like an uppercut that he can bust out of nowhere. His reversal is a charge move. But if the game's so slow, you can do perfect reversals with like just 
normal hits, right? Like standing roundhouse. And you can tell if they hit early, if they if they try to hit your roundhouse, you can duck under and hit low roundhouse for trip. Like it it, it worked in my advantage because I think I was able to see the game at a at a slower pace than people were playing. Like it was kind of like the matrix for me back then because my reactions were really good and I just had a really good knowledge of the game at that point. And mm-hmm. I, I I liked it. And I don't say that because well I was the best at that version, but I don't say that because of that, but it, it, it kind of fit my it fit my style because I don't like randomness in Street Fighters, right? Which is why I don't really like Third Strike. Like, there's a 50-50 system in Third Strike called the Pair, right? Obviously, but in in Super, when it came out, there's no randomness. The game's slower. I believe the smarter the smarter player won, the more calculated player won. Um, speed didn't play a factor because, you know, you, you don't make a mistake hitting a button too early or too late. You could really legit get perfect perfect counters with with neutrals not like a, just like i said natural hits mm-hmm. and like it is i thought it was a good game it was a little bit slow definitely it's not for like for competition i thought it was perfect for general audience it's a little boring it's not suitable for you know your regular fan because they're looking for more action so mm-hmm. it's they catered to the competitive scene, I believe, at that point, because I think James Goddard was uh, the head like at that point, and he had a lot of input, and he, he was into the competitive scene. I mean, he created the character DJ and stuff, for those who don't know, and James is still around developing games and doing stuff like that, but I think it was really catered towards uh, the competitive scene, and I think that's where Street Fighter started to slowly die out in in the general public because of that version, and then after that, you know, they came out with Super Turbo and they juiced it up faster, added Super, which I think kind of killed the competitive scene for a while because it's the random factor, right? Now you got Supers and you got Supers in like 4% out of like one hit. And people, people didn't really like that. That's where you got a huge change in the, a lot of the competitive scene change. The older players just decided to quit because, like I said, they don't want to lose to all their hard work and just lose to Super in like a matter of seconds. So. It, it was a big, it was a big defining moment in Street Fighter, and I'm, I'm glad it survived. But I thought it, it could have potentially died, just from that version alone. I think that version alone could have killed the whole franchise. So it was a, it was a weird time. Sorry, and you're referring to Super Turbo, right? Super, Super. I thought could have killed oh, just the super. whole. Oh, just Super. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, Super. Yeah. Um, even even before uh, CPS two came out. And I don't know if you you remember this, Mike, but even among casual fans, there was always this anticipation of Street Fighter 3, right? Like even back, you know, in in, in the CE days or even in the hyper fighting days, there was always this anticipation. Like, when are we going to see Street Fighter 3? When are we going to see Street Fighter 3? Like, do you remember that April Fool's ad? Or or I think it was that there was some sort of it was some sort of joke ad. I don't know if it was I don't know if I'm referring to the to the Shang Long or, you know, I, I think there was another sort of. April Fool's ad or, or, or story about Street Fighter 3 or whatever. Yeah, I was like in an EGM magazine, right? Back then, they would say like yeah. Shing Long and Chun Li yeah. throwing the bracelet and stuff. Yeah. They would publish articles with these stupid yeah. fake moves in it. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah, because Street Fighter 2 was such a global phenomenon, uh, it, it's only understandable that people were always looking for the next thing, right? And, and, and also, something that maybe people don't you know, remember back in the day is that, you know, in the arcade scene, Capcom was competing with SNK, you know, and, and I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, I, I remember back in the day when I was growing up, almost every week or every other week, a new, like, SNK game came out, you know? Right, it was right, like, yeah, like Art of Fighting and yeah. back then. It was, it Fatal was Fury. Fury. I talk a lot of shit and it was a joke back then. It's like, if you didn't speak English, you play SNK games, right? Because if you spoke <laughs> English, you became friends with the Street Fighter players. But if you were a fob or if you're a Mexican that doesn't, you know, like, it's how the races, right? And I'm sorry, dude, but we're just like, it's just telling the truth. Like, if you were, if you were a non-English speaking person, you were playing King of Fighters. If you yeah. spoke English, you played Street Fighters. That, that's just how it was back then, man. No, no, I definitely think, I don't think it's racist to point out that certain ethnic groups gravitated towards certain games. 
I mean, that's just kind of your perception. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I kind of saw that too, right? You know, with the SNK games. And, and, and a lot of it was also uh, equipment, consoles. You know, I know um, we still haven't really talked about all any of the individual arcades. Uh, but there were some arcades that had Japanese cabs. Um, there was the cafes, like random boba cafes, random gaming yeah. stores. They had Japanese cabs. So there was also the, the, the equipment divide as well. Street Fighter players played on American hat parts. You know, when you played the SNK games, even though you had the red you know, arcade SNK cabs, which I remember, because I remember there was a spot called Duffy's Liquor, which is, uh, which was a, uh, a convenience store next to, uh, our local library. And just like a random bodega liquor store, it was so random, but it had the new SNK games all the time, right? It had, you know, we played Fatal Fury 2, we played Art of Fighting, we played World Heroes, um, Pirates Cove was the first place I, I played KOF 94, which was the first KOF. Um, and so kind of what I was getting at is that I don't know if you felt this way, Mike, but I feel like Capcom, a lot of the decisions they were making at the time, as far as developing their games, I, I definitely think, you know, they felt pressure with SNK because SNK was putting out all of the you know, all of the attempts to kind of compete with Street Fighter, right? Yeah. And, and Street Fighter was like the same game, but then SNK kept coming out with these different games. Fatal Fury, The Art of Fightings, The World Heroes, The Samurai Showdowns. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. and, and one of the things that I started noticing, and I don't know if you noticed this too, but just in the arcades in general, the popularity of Street Fighter started to wane a little bit, right? Because they had all these different competitors. I'm not even, we haven't even mentioned Mortal Kombat, the impact of Mortal Kombat on, on, on Street Fighter. Um, but also a Fighter's History, right? And there was Fighter's, Fighter's History. Yeah. I don't know if you remember those games, like Time Killers. Time Killers? Like, dude, it was just some weird stuff was coming out at that time. Just everyone yeah. was trying to, trying to get a piece of their pie, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, but, uh, so, you know, after, you know, after Super Turbo came out, um, it was clear that Capcom was was planning to to go a, a different direction. You know, aesthetically, you know, gameplay wise, and again, that anticipation of Street Fighter Three returned, and then instead we get the Alpha series, which pretty much dominated, you know, most of the most of the mid nineties. But then during that time, Watts and I, and I found this very strange, and and I would love to get. You know, maybe one day, you know, get the input of people who may have been there as far as developing and promoting these games. But talk, talk to me a little bit about the Street Fighter 3 series. Because Street Fighter 3, uh, new generation, um, I believe came out in 1996. Um, during that era, basically the tournament scene was dominated by the Alpha series at that point. You know, this is obviously, you know, the Valle and Daigo rivalry. You know, Alpha Two, Alpha Three, and then the Street Fighter, and then Street, the first Street Fighter Three comes out. Like, what do you remember about that game? Like, did you? Because I, from what I remember, I don't remember any hype. I don't remember any anticipation. I don't remember any promoting. It was just kind of like, okay, here's Street Fighter Three. Like, remember the cabs? They didn't even say Street Fighter. They just said three. I remember that. Like, I was watching your other podcast with Paul, and it was mentioned. Yeah. It, it, Refresh my memory though. Dude, it just said three on the fucking marquee. It wasn't even three <laughs> fighters, it wasn't nothing. It was just three. Like, okay, I'm supposed to play three. And the only recognizable characters are what, Ryu and Ken in the, yeah. in the beginning? So they're just trying to force feed you like Ryu and Ken in a in a like a whole new world. And they expected that to do something. And uh -huh. you know, I I didn't really play that game. At that point I kind of like started fading away from the scene a little bit. And uh, uh -huh. but I, I did I did try it. And I remember distinctly getting jumped on, I uppercut, I get parried, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, and I think that totally turned me off on the whole, the whole three series as a, as a game. And I think I like really vanished from the scene from the whole, like the whole three and the whole two I scene. Mm -hmm. And then I came back when two I was getting a, a little bit of momentum. Uh, people from New York started coming over to play. And like I said, I love competition. I didn't really play the game, but I played just because, like I said, it's the competition. Eddie Lee, you know, he was a really good, uh, he was a really good player from East Coast. He's probably the number one player before Justin took over. 
he was super sick at the game. He played Buki and he had the infinite down. And, you know, I lost a few bucks watching that shit fucking kill me a few times. I was like, okay, oh, this game really for me. Maybe I should a little bit. And then, uh, Mm-hmm. So I came out, and you know that's when that's when I started to step back in, and they had a free trip to Japan for B4 and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. yeah, I kind of missed out on a I don't know maybe a good two two and a half years of Street Fighter Three. Thankfully, mm-hmm. I want to say thankfully because I don't think those games were very good, but it was definitely a a, a huge change in direction. Uh, the graphics were kind of cool. Um, There's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff, but like I said, the, just the introduction of more possibilities of random things happening is kind of a turnoff to like a highly competitive player, you know? So you always want to be in control, and whenever you give someone a 50-50 option, that kind of, it kind of takes all the, the thinking and, and brainstorming out the window where you're just like, okay, I'm going to flip a coin right here. Whoever wins, wins this moment, and it's not a, it's not very good for a very calculated player, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, but but I think to be fair, you know, one of the reasons why you experience success early on, and this is a point that I've been making, you know, in the last few years, um, but despite of all of the things, you know, that people say about Third Strike, like, for example, you know, the idea that someone like for like example, for someone like Justin Wong, who continues to play to this day, for him to just be able to enter a random Third Strike tournament and, and, and either win it or at least get top three. Or, or or top eight, like a lot, historically, a lot of people have kind of used that as a knock on the game, right? But in 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 the last couple of years, I've I've started to kind of develop a different opinion. You know, like to me, that's like a hallmark of why the game is so good, because a player like Justin Wong, a player like yourself, can rely to a certain extent, right, on fundamentals, on footsies, spacing, things of that nature, with punishing. Um, and, and, and because you're right, Watts, you know, there is a point in third strike where you want to get the opponent in that situation for the 50, 50, but how you get them in that situation, right? That, that depends on all of the things that you brought to the table, right? Like spacing footsies and and things of that nature. Like, how do you get to that, to that point? Um, but you know, I think today, I think now would be a good time to take our first break. I know we went a little bit over, but there was a lot to cover, but, uh, we're going to take a quick break, maybe uh, two or three minutes. And then when we come back, we're going to start, uh, the chapter of third strike and talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the early days of, of third strike. And so yes. don't go anywhere Stick guys. Around Stick around for this. There's a lot of, a lot of shit talk. Stick around. Yeah. You don't wanna... <laughs> In the meantime, um, you know, if you want to follow uh, Watson on Twitter, if you if you aren't already, uh, definitely check his uh, Twitter out, twitter.com slash superdojo. And so we're going to go ahead and take a quick two to three minute break. But when we come back, more episode 50 of the Mutant Experience podcast with Mike Watson to come. Don't go anywhere, anyone, everyone. Welcome back, everyone, to episode 50 of the Mutant Experience Podcast. Uh, I thank all of you who have decided to uh, spend your lazy Sunday going down uh, memory lane with my super special guest, the FGC legend, Mike Watson. 
Uh, also, uh, this is episode 50. And so I wanted to also send a shout out uh, to everyone who has supported the podcast the last uh, two or three years. Um, I never really thought I would get to episode 50. And so uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, for following the podcast. And uh, speaking of which, uh, if you want to check out uh, more uh, Mutant Experience podcasts, uh, just go to my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Mutant Experience. Uh, to check out some other of my uh, Third Strike podcasts if you want to learn more about the Third Strike scene and its history. And so speaking of Third Strike history, Watts, um, I know I mentioned this uh, earlier on the show, but you've been there since the beginning. And so I always ask my guests this, um, but do you remember the first time you played Third Strike? Because I do. Uh, I, played it the, I played it for the first time at Regency Fun Center in yeah. Lakewood, California. Uh, you're very familiar with that place. It's a bowling alley slash arcade. They also had that uh, that soul food place. I don't know if you you, you ever ate. Yeah, they had collard greens the, over there, dude. That's the they only place collard greens. Collard greens for like a twenty mile radius. Yeah, that was the first time I was introduced to macaroni and cheese with the sugar. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> so um, so where 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 did you do you remember where, when you first played Third Strike? You know, it was probably a golf run. I can't be 100% sure. And the only reason we played Third Strike back then was because there was a long line on Marvel next to it. And then you're just waiting to, after fucking Duck kicks your ass in Marvel, you're waiting for your turn. And then you're like, fuck this. And then you just go play a couple games of Third Strike. And then you don't even care if it's in the middle of the round or not. When it's your turn to play Marvel, you just abandon fucking Third Strike and jump the Marvel machine. So do you, do you remember where, like, what arcade you first played during yeah, Strike? Southern or? Hills Golf Land. Probably Southern, Southern Hills. Hills. You know, that's something we haven't really talked about much, and that's Southern Hills Golf Land. Um, I remember first going to Southern Hills Golf Land around 2001 era. Um, you know, it was just a place to go because a lot of the arcades were closing, particularly right. in our hometown of Monterey Park. Yeah. Uh, a lot, uh, at some point, I think a law was passed in Monterey Park at some point. Um you know, there was a lot of game activity back then, right? So mm -hmm. there was a lot of shootings. There was a lot of fights. Um, I I can't say whether or not I was involved in any of those fights, but there was a lot of fights <laughs> back then, and uh -huh. just a, it was just a different time, you know. Like, uh, fortunately, there was no cell phone cameras back then, or else a lot of people would probably be in trouble. But mm -hmm. it's just, you know, like I said, just throw. Just generally, if you throw someone in the game, you're getting into a fight, and. Mm -hmm. like, Kids nowadays they, they can't fathom that, but it's just it's just it's just a, a tough way of growing up, you know. And things aren't things aren't always you know peaches and cream like they are now. Mm -hmm. So the cab where you played Dirt Strike at Southern Hills Golf Land was that the one across from the from the from the place where you would get the pizza and the change, yeah. and yeah. that's where it was located then, right? Mm -hmm. Very so, convenient to the token machine. Mm -hmm. So who are some of the players that you kind of remember? Because you had said, right, that it was just something to play while you were waiting for your turn on Marvel or whatever. Um, but who are some of the players that you kind of remember, like, at the very, very early days? Like, I'm talking, like, the first year that Third Strike was at Southern Hills. You know, were there yeah. any players that were kind of on there I can, regularly? I can remember the Shadow crew coming down. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about when I say Shadow, but they kind of turned into FFA crew. Like, mm -hmm. Combo Fiend was a decent player back then. He played Denjin Ryu. Mm -hmm. Um, Combo would come down once in a blue moon to the tournament. A Kuma Combo Fiend or Frankie? Combo. No, so he used Denjin Ryu before. Yes, he was a oh, Ryu. Okay. Wow. And okay. And then you had a. I remember Holly would show up once in a while. Holly was definitely there on like weekends. I remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, Vi would come play once in a while when he wasn't playing Marvel. Uh, who else would play? Dude, like. That that's that's probably about it. I remember Pyro came down once or twice mm -hmm. to challenge Vi, and I remember Vi just beating the shit out of him and kind of like trying to like trying to give him advice, but it was more like, "Hey, I'm your daddy. You're gonna remember I'm your daddy. Don't try to be better than me so fast. You know, it's not time yet." And I remember those days. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, that was kind of the. The, the early, earlier memories of Third Strike, but it wasn't popular at all, man. Like, mm -hmm. like at any point, you would see someone just playing against the computer. It's not like, it's not a game where there was people constantly waiting in line or tokens were lined up on the screen to play at that point. The game was just dead. It was really just dead. 
And why do you think that was, Watts? Do you think it was because of, you know, just the way that Capcom treated the launch of, of SF3 and, and 2i? Or was it just, was, was, was the focus too more on Alpha? Or, you know, what was... I think Alpha 3 was still really popular, but then Marvel 2 was just the, the phenomenon of the time, right? You got three on three, three on three with, you know, Marvel characters in it and Street Fighter characters, and the game was really fast-paced, and you got fucking lasers and ice beams and fucking missiles flying all over the place and people <laughs> were just you know more into that at the time it was, mm-hmm. it was a really interesting game i can't lie you know i spent a lot of time playing it myself so mm-hmm. that game, yeah, think, that game mm-hmm. just took away the attention from everything that game just dominated everything for for quite a while yeah thinking back on those you know those day, those days when i first started going to southern hills just the kind of competition third strike had because <laughs> like all like you mentioned all the other games were so godlike you know like just and so hype marvel we haven't even talked about the kofs i don't really notice a whole i didn't really notice a whole lot of mortal Kombat at southern hills i don't know if that right? was, i don't it wasn't popular really i think mm-hmm. mk2 was good right everyone played mk2 even if you're a street fighter player you played mk2 because you could learn fundamentals mk3 it was kind of weird because it has a run button so the, the audience kind of was, was a push Mm-hmm. So I think that game, that game really died off back then. And yeah, just Capcom was fortunate to be able to take over. And like I said, Marvel was just Marvel's Marvel, and it's still played to this day, like at the highest level. And it's really, really exciting, and really fun to watch still. So Marvel is mm-hmm. Marvel held its own for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then like I like I said before, you know the KOF had a lot of had a huge presence at Southern Hills, you know, in the early two thousands. Um, you know, the the KOF that I like to play back in the day. Cause I, I like Marvin and I, we first started going to Southern Hills, not really for Street Fighter. We went there to play KOF. You know, we there we went there to play ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine when it first came out. So, you know, when I first played Third Strike at at at, at Regency, like I had a very similar reaction that you did. It was like, whatever. <laughs> it was like um you know chun oh, oh chun is back but but she doesn't play anything like you know chun was like at the time because yeah like right. I, I i just always found it weird that you know sort of in the middle of sort of the popularity of the alpha series you know they would release you know the street fighter 3 series um but again i guess you know because it was the arcade culture back then you know they were trying to compete with other companies or whatever um, right. but you're right in Southern Hills, uh, third strike really didn't get a whole lot of love. Um, you know, maybe that's why it was across right across from the change machine, or I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it and was really like the first game you saw when you turned around. Yeah. And I think third strike actually got really lucky because I don't know if you remember alpha tried to come out with an updated version of alpha called alpha three gold or alpha three upper. You remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And that game failed miserably. Like that game was just shit, right? Like, <laughs> People were like all hyped up and they just got a big letdown. And I think some of that fan base of Alpha transferred over to Third Strike because Alpha was getting a little bit old, right? So they wanted something new. So I think I think that was a little bit of a changing point in Third Strike where they gained a little bit of just a little bit of momentum just from having Alpha getting fucked up like that in the arcade release of gold. So mm-hmm. I thought they were very lucky at that point. So let's talk a little bit about the you know early sort of national third strike competitive scene um more specifically let's talk a little bit about b4 uh for those of you who are unfamiliar uh the battle at the bay series was the precursor of the evolution championship series um i I believe um b4 uh took place uh uh like in the like sometime in 2000 uh i'm trying to uh i told myself not to forget when when b4 took place but um b4 was i think the first national third strike tournament um uh you know obviously this isn't counting you know other other regions that might have had third strike tournaments um but in b4 um that was the first i guess you would say evo third strike tournament you know before evo even even came about and so b4 2000 like the game hasn't even been out a year um i think top eight was in this order valle shen Choi which was really surprising. Um, Eddie Lee got fourth. Um, and then you and Martin Vega tied for fifth. And then uh, 
uh, and then uh, Mike Mike D and uh, Dream TR, aka Jason Wilson. The dude, I remember, this is this is like the first time Shin Chang ever came out, right? No one ever heard of this guy, mm-hmm. and he was the first guy that taught us that you can uh, tech throws ducking. We had no idea, right? Like he <laughs> the had crouch a, tech, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one knew you could do that ever because it's just not normal, right? You got to hold the direction and tech throw, and he would literally tech throw holding down back and. We called him the Texas Tecker, right? That was the name we just gave him because he's just teching all day long. And we're like, God, this guy plays like such a, excuse me, but we called him a, you know, a derogatory term back then for men who like men. We're like, this guy plays like such a, you know, and I was like, and like, we just hated him because his defense was just awesome back then, you know, and mm-hmm. he was, he was probably the first third strike player in America, like the first advanced third strike player. He was playing third strike the way it should be played before anyone else was. He had a, those stupid Akuma set up. I don't know where he was getting his tech from. I don't know where he was getting his information. But I know he traveled back and forth overseas and stuff, so I'm sure he kind of brought back some stuff from Taiwan or maybe he even went to Japan. I don't know. We didn't know him that well back then, so I'm not, not very familiar with that. But, yeah, he was one of the first people to be in America to play third strike how it should be. Or how it was meant to be played at a high level. So mm-hmm. I want to say he's probably like the the innovative, the first innovative third strike player in America. I'll give him credit for that for sure. Mm-hmm. And so B four took place um, in, in in Folsom. You know, in in, in uh, I guess what we would call that Central Cali, Northern Cali. Uh, yeah, it's more Northern Cali. Folsom was kind of I don't know. It's like. It's like if you tell someone in China, Ontario, you know, they're like, well, oh, whatever. Well, it's kind of close to that way, you know, so this place was kind of close to San Jose or Frisco, I guess, but it's not really. Mm-hmm. So the previous so one, the previous one took place at Sunnyvale, right? B3. B3, B3 took yeah. place at Sunnyvale. Do you know why they moved B4 to, to Folsom? I think they wanted more control. They had control of the venue better. It was a closed venue for us, whereas... Uh, at Sunnyvale, we were inside Golfland, and we're forced to leave when they leave. We we don't have access to fix the machines when they needed to be fixed or anything. We had to rely on the, the tech at Golfland. And, you know, Golfland employees aren't exactly, you know, top-tier techs. So, you know, you ask them to fix a button, it probably takes like 10 minutes where we could just do it in 10 seconds. It's just, it's just overall better venue. Uh, the Canon, we're very fortunate that the Canons are very well off, and they love the scene. So... They put a lot of money and time into it, and mm-hmm. they provided they provided the home for us back then, which is something we should forever be thankful for. You know, you, you just mentioned something, Watts, that that kind of made me like think about this. Also, that was kind of kind of the difficult thing about uh, coming up in the arcade scene is that the people that worked at a lot of these venues, um, again, these venues were legendary. And shout outs to the owners and everyone who who had worked in these venues. But I, I think it's fair to say, Watts, right? That like in the early FGC, especially, you know, the arcade scene FGC, um, a lot of the like not to say that a lot of the a lot of the owners or a lot of the people who worked there, you know, didn't have any respect for the FGC or competitive Street Fighter. But it was it, it always seemed like a constant struggle, right? Like for the, for people to take the FGC seriously, like j- just like you know, like for example, like you said, your example of like a random tech at an arcade, right? Like this is some teenager, and like he sees an arcade, and it's just for fun. Kids are running around. It's just you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a thing for leisure. It's 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 something that's not really taken that seriously. And then here you have. You know, a bunch of teenagers, twenty year olds, a lot of testosterone, a lot of ego, you know, and, and 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 we really did take, you know, in those few hours, right, that we played competitive Street Fighter, we took it very seriously. And so, you know, kind of looking back on it, right, it, it did seem like a constant struggle, you know, to kind of get the respect just as a scene in general. I mean, would you agree with that? Uh, well, I can give you this example. So mm-hmm. You understand, like, we were in the competitive scene, like, really heavily, and you as a competitor, you were really into it, but you got to look at it now, too. Even the people that are in the competitive scene, Mm -hmm. they're in the tournament, and they're still not even that into it. So they're fully submerged into our environment, and they're still not into it. So I don't want to say there's a very select few, but there's 
there's not that many people that really truly love the game or that are truly dedicated into loving anything in general, right? Like, not many people are very passionate about what they really love. And the few that are, they're either successful or they've gone up and turned into a business or whatnot. But if the people that are already there aren't fully into it, it's kind of hard to expect an outsider to understand why do they love this so much or why, why do they spend five hours a day training? Why, why after that training do they go out and eat and talk about the game for two more hours? Like, people don't understand that. And it's just, unless you're really passionate about your, your hobby or unless you really love what you do, you're never going to fully, fully understand how someone else can be so dedicated or how someone else can be so into doing something, right? So it's just... It's just one of those things where some people are there just to be there. Some people are there just to hang out. Some people are there for the competition. Some people are there to prove they're the best. Like everyone's there for a different reason. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's the great thing about the community. You can be there for many reasons and you can all have a common interest, but you can't really, you can't really compare who has a stronger drive and you can't really, you can't really like force the love upon someone. Like it's something that, they're either going to learn to or they have already or they're not going to, but they're just there and they appreciate it, but they don't fully understand like the full, full love of doing something for a certain reason. So it's kind, mm -hmm. of, it's kind of a hard thing to explain, but hopefully it generalizes it somewhat where people kind of get what I'm saying. No, I, I think I kind of understand what you're saying. You know, a another reason why B4 is obviously, you know, really famous is because it was the subject of you know one of the first probably if not the first fgc documentary right which of course i'm referring to to, to bang the machine and i don't want to talk too much about you know bang the machine and b4 because you know people can just watch the documentary and and, and, and figure it out but but what are some of the things you remember about the documentary because we had already talked about your documentary with tomo but what was your what, what are some of your memories about that documentary bang okay so Every competitive player dreams of going to Japan to compete against the best of the best, right? And mm -hmm. at this point, I've already been playing the game for 15 years, right? And it's like, you know, I quit the game already. I came back because they're offering a free trip, which is something that, you know, it's not really affordable. One night in Japan in a decent hotel was 350 bucks back then. Mm -hmm. And we're going there for 10 nights. We have a free room, free airfare. So it's basically like a $5,000 package that we're winning. And it's just, just dreaming about the experience is just, it's awesome. And then that's just Japan, you know, like it, it's a whole other, it's a whole other world over there. Like, mm -hmm. Video games are their life. Mm -hmm. Where over here, we're kind of looked, we looked at a little bit strange when we say, hey, video games are a hobby or anime is our hobby when, but that's what we love. And then when we go over there, that's the normal, that's the mainstream. So it's like we're jumping into a world that, we feel like we're going to be comfortable in, but then when you get over there, it's a culture shock. It's, it's, it's amazing and it's a lot to take in, but that trip is, it's a trip of a lifetime. If you're a, if you're a street fighter or just a fighting game fan, you know, it's a, it's a trip of a lifetime. And if you ever have a chance to do it, you should do it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that experience was crazy. There's so many stories to talk about and I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll lead me into them a little bit more as we go on, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's let, let's get into that trip to Japan because um, for those uh, for those of you in the chat who 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 may not be familiar with really early Dirt Strike history, um, before again was 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 uh, you know the, what Evo was called before it was called Evo, and so in before. Uh, Watson, you, uh, you, you, and I don't, what were, what were the exact rules? Like, like, how did you earn the trip? You had to win one of the tournaments at B4 or you had to get top five or what exactly, how did you, how exactly did you qualify for Team USA? Do you remember? For B4? Okay. So B4 had top five placers in points to okay. make it on the, the team. Uh, there were five games and we made the point system where First place is weighed real heavily. That way we get the best player for that game on the team for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, But only the top three spots were paid for. Because mm -hmm. that was the budget, I guess, from, uh, from the filmmakers. They offered us top three spots. So then by like 
dude, just the showing of his life. And he placed, I think, top two in like every fucking game or top three in every game. Yeah. So he was like a lock. Yeah. So, and so, Troy, but well, the one game, the one game that Valle didn't win at B4 was Super Turbo because, okay. because someone else won that. You won yeah. that. I won um, Super there was a lot of controversy behind that win, though, because for those who don't know, there was a there was a camera crew there, <laughs> and this is the reason I hate fucking camera crews, and I hate people taking pictures when we're playing games. <laughs> okay. So we're playing on these big showcase cabinets, right? And mm -hmm. it's already distracting enough where you got some guy standing behind the the screen holding a fucking stick with a boom mic, which is a microphone attached to a fucking stick, and trying mm -hmm. to catch what you're saying or catch some crowd reactions and shit. This fucking idiot literally touches my fucking nose with the boom with mic? The mic in the <laughs> middle of the fucking match for a round ending kill. <laughs> it rolls off my timing just that one hair where Vi fucking reversals me instead of me getting a perfect chip. And holy shit, I fucking flipped out, dude. Like We have like a mic on us. Like, the top players had a mic. We were mic'd up. I fucking grabbed the mic. I threw that shit across the room like, fuck you, you motherfucker. What the fuck? Like, I was ready to kill someone. The pressure's already high, right? You're like, you're like, you're like dreaming. I'm going to Japan. I'm going to Japan. It's fucking amazing. I'm going to Japan. And all of a sudden, it's like ripped from your hands, and you just want to fucking kill somebody, right? And then I'm like, they're like, what the fuck? I'm like, this asshole fucking touched me with the mic on my fucking face. What the fuck, man? And dude, it was just it was a big scene. And mm -hmm. if you watch the video, it's kind of hard to understand. But it's like, in the heat of the moment, like Street Fighter is all about perfect timing, right? Like there's a lot of one frame and this and that. And if you're thrown off just by a hair, it's it's totally game altering, right? And in a change of a second, it, it a match could be won or lost just from one move, right? And it's like we're battling to go to Japan. And that happened, and it's like, it becomes such a fucking shit show, and it, I felt like, I felt like it took away from what should have been a prouder moment, but Lucky Vibe, you know, he's my homie, and he's like, hey, we'll replay it, it's fine. But even during the replay, like, I could tell he felt bad for me, and then I wasn't playing as good, too, so we're both not playing what we were playing, like. Because like you we can't were, recreate that moment yeah. anymore, right? You can't recreate yeah, it anymore. You can't recreate it. Like they're like, hey, it's it's like playing in the bubble in the NBA. People are like, it's like a pickup game, right? There's no crowd. It's just not the fucking same, you know. Like you already know what the outcome is going to be, and like I know he's going to go easy on me because he wants me to go. Like I know, I know these things, but it takes away and it makes me feel like less of a competitor, and I'm pissed off. And now it's like, I'm playing a little bit weaker because I see him playing weaker and I think it's unfair, you know? It's kind of like one of those honor things, like, okay, he's going to play at 90%, fuck it, I'll play at 90% too then. And it's like, it just, it created like this, this fucked up environment and it really, it kind of like puts a tarnish on, on everything that we, we've been playing for our whole life to get to this, this pinnacle in our career, you know? And it, I feel like just all the media, all the bullshit, all the cameras, like, it's just, I, I don't, I don't like that aspect of the game nowadays. I really don't. I don't like how people are all in your face. I don't mind you recording matches from behind. Just chill out. Be quiet, you know? Like, but like I said, all the cameras and all that stuff, it's really distracting, and it really takes away from the true, true feeling of the game. You know, it's supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one competition. You two are locked in the heat of the moment in battle. And then it's like, you know, it, it, it's supposed to be like an intimate moment, you know? Like, like, it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, and they just take that away from you. And I feel like I got that taken away from me when, when that happened. And that's why I've had this, like, like eh, I've had this gripe about that stuff for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, d despite all the things that happened during the documentary filming, I mean, you did, um, uh, and you, you, did, you earned a top three spot, right? You, you, yes. you, yeah. So, you know, what does this have to do with Third Strike history, right? Well, that's because the very first U.S. versus Japan exhibition for Third Strike actually happened in Japan. Um, and, and it was it was Team USA and, you know, the people who had earned enough points to be on the team. I think it was uh, yourself, Valle, Shin, Eddie, um, Eddie Lee, and, and there's um, one, Justin? No, Justin wasn't there yet. I um, 
who was it? Who was the? Was that it? I think that was it, right? Was that? I think four it was players? four. It, it was, was just four. four, right? Yeah, it was just yeah. four. Four players. Yeah, me, so, Eddie, me, Eddie, Shem, and Mm-hmm. So now you know when you went over there, that wasn't the only exhibition you participated in. You know, you played no. other exhibitions. So third strike oh. was probably like like what was your approach to like the third strike exhibition? Because like you had already said, right? It's not it, it's not a very popular game yet. It just kind of came out. You know, what was your team's kind of mindset when it came to Third Strike? And, okay, so and how seriously did you guys take that exhibition? Before the lead up to all this, right, there's a lot of stuff that happened. So mm -hmm. we were getting taken around Japan. We were getting, you know, the experience of like Game Newton. Mm -hmm. You know, that guy Matsu took us around. I, I don't know if it was Haya or the other famous uh, Hugo player, but we got introduced to the fucking state. Can you say that again, Mike? Because you, you kind of cut up. And then before that, we were going, so we're going, we're, you know, I got introduced to the standing 720 by either Hayao or I forgot who the other famous Hugo player was back then. Might have been YSB. And, Might have been y yeah, maybe that guy. But we were going to random arcades, okay? We're just going to random arcades. Like, mm -hmm. not Sega City, nothing big, not not like, uh, I don't know, game, more, more arcade. And we were going to random play, like, literally, like, kind of like the, the bowling alleys or. Just the shitholes. And we're playing third strike and stuff. And we're getting our fucking ass kicked, right? We're like, fuck, <laughs> these guys are sick of this game. This is bullshit, dude. <laughs> and then, um, he realized it at the time, but he translated to English and he said, oh, Sorry, I'm sorry, Mike. Can you, uh, you guys are kicking our ass. Sorry, Mike, but uh, you're 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 cutting yeah, out a little bit. Can you can you repeat that part again? Sorry, man, you're 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 cutting out a little. So, like bit. I said, we're going to these shitty arcades, mm -hmm. and then we're getting our ass kicked. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the guy told us, the translator told us, "Oh, don't worry, those guys." We can mm -hmm. cut out. Here. You want me to reset uh, Discord real fast? No, that's fine. C continue. Go ahead. Okay, so after getting beat the fuck up. Mm -hmm. And then being told these guys aren't even on the team, and those guys are already kicking our ass. We're like, oh my god, dude! Like, then who the fuck's on the team if these guys aren't? We're fucking, we're so done. Mm -hmm. And then we go to Game Newton, and then fucking we get fucked up even worse by like everybody. Like they're just taking turns on us, dude. We're just like getting mopped the fuck up. Okay. So the whole week prior, we're playing on Japanese sticks. We're not used to the hardware. Our, 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 our and then we have this issue where Eddie Lee's flying in the day before the tournament and he wants mm -hmm. to play. But now there's an argument because he wants to play on, on the Marvel team, but I've been practicing Marvel the whole time. And I'm like, no, fuck you. You can't have it. So they, they wanted me to give him the spot, or he wanted me to give him the spot. And I was like, no. So he offered to play for it. And we played for it, and I beat him in the three out of five. Mm -hmm. So the day of the tournament, now this guy's bitching, right? He's like, if I don't get to play on the Marvel team... I don't want to play anything. And at the time, we needed him for Alpha 3, and we needed him for Third Strike. He was the best man for that spot to fill it, because there's no one else to fill it at that time. So we, we wanted him. And this is where, in, in the movie, Bang the Machine, I don't know if you've seen it, but mm -hmm. there's like an almost fight scene where I threaten the shit out of him and Henry Sen, and I said, I'm going to fuck you guys up. You guys better fucking play, or I'm going to kill you, and stuff like that. And just the whole mood is like, fuck up already and then in like a matter of five more minutes we're supposed to go and put on a show and of course the first game we play is fucking third strike right and i'm just like oh jesus man we're gonna go out there and get fucked up now after i'm already pissed off but that's when i discovered hey when i get pissed off i play much better so mm -hmm. so we're going to play, play uh, I, I believe I have to play Rao. People who probably play Rao. I would like to play Rao. I was kind in a movie theater with like, like a uh, stadium seating in a movie theater. And we're sitting on the stage with two arcade cabinets and a big screen showing the game large. Mm -hmm. This is the most like nerve wracking scene you could ever be put into. We're overseas, we're outmanned, and these guys are just. Dude, it's, it's ridiculous, right? 
Yeah, we'll see in the video. It's crazy. It's just so scary, dude. Yeah. So right now we're uh, we're watching a uh, a video of the B. It, it's mislabeled. It's it, it really is a, the B four, right? The B four uh, exhibition, what? Team USA versus Team Japan. And again, I believe this is the very first USA versus Japan exhibition in, in Third Strike history. Um, if if you don't count, um. Again, I'm trying to remember exactly, you know, when the Japanese went to Nebraska, but um, this is at the very least one of the very first um, exhibitions. Um, wow, is that is that is that Alex in the in the chat, Alex Valle? Wow, how's it going, Alex? If if, if that's really you, man. Wow, okay. thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate it. If that's really you. <laughs> so so yeah, so this is the uh, the exhibition. Um, and this was uh, third strike was first, and uh, you played first. And yeah. um, Yang, tell us a little bit because you know you've used a, a lot of different characters in third strike in, throughout the history. But you know, early on, you know, I know that you've you, you've used Chun early on, Chun Yang, and then you started using Yun. Um, but why Yang here? What was what was the thinking about Yang? So I think uh, I think there was some discussion between me and Vai back then, where it's like mm -hmm. you can mix up the speed of the records and stuff and even if they could parry we could kind of we we were in control like we could stop the records we can continue to do more we could do exs and mm -hmm. since we looked at the japanese like robots we were like okay we we gotta we gotta kind of play a little bit more orthodox and we can't just do shit that they've seen all the time so we had we had the option where we can there's a lot of factor when you're playing like like yeah he's simple like a simple character you know the damage isn't too high but he, he's he's highly mobile you can get out of a lot of situations and it, we just felt more comfortable playing you know it's like a fireball motion and just stuff stuff was stuff was a little bit easier yeah that too like they you know you gotta you gotta also realize like dude they probably have one million ken and Ryus out there so there's no point even playing to their strength so we we both played that character just to just try to throw it off a little bit, and you know, I got I got super hyped. I won the first round. Like I said, came out on fire. Won the first round. Fucking, it was pretty cool. I fucking jumped in. The guy did a back fierce with Chun Li and anti air. I parried it. Then he did lightning legs, which we've never seen before. I don't know how the fuck I parried all that shit. So I parry, 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 parry. I land on the other side. He tried to fucking throw me, and I tech it. And then, dude, the crap rocks. I was like, oh, 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 shit, this is fucking cool, dude. And mm -hmm. then, I don't know how, but I won the first round, and I was like, fucking all hyped up. And all of a sudden, Chun Li turns into Chun Li, fucking soup the shit out of me, car throws the shit out of me, beats the fuck out of me. And then we're back to reality, and just like sitting there, like, ah, fuck, man, take this beating like a man. And, uh, you know, hopefully get to. Hopefully, get to a different game where we can do a little better. But yeah, that was that was the third strike experience in the in Japan. Like just especially the guy telling us, "Oh, don't worry, he's not on the team." And you know, this guy just beats the shit out of us. And he's like, "He's not even on the team because he's not good enough." That's already ah, oh, dude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, hopefully, uh, Watson uh, comes back uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, so right now, you're watching uh, footage of uh, the B4. Uh, Team USA versus Team Japan exhibition uh, that actually happened. Um, th the 20th anniversary uh, of this uh, event is actually coming up. I believe this uh, happened in November on November 26, 2000. And so we're about 10 days uh, from the 20th anniversary uh, of, of this event, uh, which is actually pretty crazy to think about. Uh, Watson, are you back? Oh, you're back. Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, Watts. Well, like, 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 like we mentioned before, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're coming up to about twenty years. Uh, this exhibition. Now, this is pre SBO, right? Like, SBO hasn't even. SBO is not even, not even a train of thought yet, dude. Mm -hmm. It's like. And and I know I asked you this. I know I asked you this offline, but do you remember, you know, what the name of this event was? Like, what the official name was? Or I don't, dude. It's fucking just the Japanese fucking slaughter of Americans, man. I don't know, dude. That's horrible. And what's up with these post round taunts? I mean, dude, we got, we got why are the Japanese? 
why are the Japanese so uh, so so uh, so colorful here? You know, I I noticed I saw a lot of post round tots. You know, <laughs> you know what, man? Like just for the movie, we were told to do a couple things and act up. I think I want to believe that they told them, hey, just fucking showboat a little bit and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because you know, for the most part, their culture is very very respectful and whatnot. So I, I don't want to think that, you know, but Rao, Rao's an asshole. We all know that. Like anybody that's come about <laughs> Rao, we know that Rao is like a fucking dickhead, right? Like that guy's like the prick of the community in Japan, in my uh -huh. opinion. So right? Vi and mentions just, in the chat that Rao was a tester for Third Strike. Which, oh, really? Is that true? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck him. I'll kick his ass right now. Fuck him. He ain't that good. <laughs> I have faith in my Third Strike skill. I've improved so much. Like, I didn't even know how to play the game back then, dude. So I was like, fuck that. So, I, so, you, it, so, so in a first to ten, if if we were able to get Rao to play you in a first to ten arcade, you think you would beat Rao? A... Yes. Yes. Okay. I do. <laughs> okay, okay. Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll we'll, we'll be able to, to to make that set happen at some point. Uh, I, wait, so, so I waited seven years for Mester after this. I got my revenge seven years later on Mester. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I can wait for Rao. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Justin, up. Justin got him pissed off. Even Humvee beat Rao. Yeah, at Evo 2K6. That's right. And Humvee, oh, Rao tried to cheat him too. Rao fucking paused the game mid fucking combo on Hung. That's and right. That's right. I was, like, I was like, fuck you, man. I fucking said, Hung, fucking wait. Because Rao tried to unpause. I'm like, nah, fuck that. Hung, pause that shit. Fuck this guy. And I called the cannons over. I'm like, hey, this asshole's fucking doing his bullshit again. <laughs> and they let. Let Hung start the combo all over again, the juggle. So he got a full juggle on him. I remember and he fucking that. beat him, dude. I remember that. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your trip to Japan. You know, th this was your first and only trip there. You yes. haven't been back since. That's correct? No, um, no. Now, I mean, obviously, we have the documentary and everything. But, you know, just how much Third Strike did you play over there? Aside from the exhibition and the... Compared to the... Because you, you went there and you played... All the games, right? It's just what you, it wasn't just third strike, but you know how much third strike. Someone put in chat, right? It was it was seven Americans versus thirty Japanese, right? Like I think yeah. me and Vi played every game, and I think Troy played like three out of four games, and who else? Eddie played like three out of the four games. Dude, all of us had to play all these games while they had their number one to <laughs> number three, like four play like the top players in every player. We couldn't have every game. No, no we weren't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. At the time, we were just you know, we're in their home court. You know, it was like whatever. Fuck it. We were the. We we did okay. We did okay. We won a few games in Alpha Three. I think Alex got the only win in Third Strike against. Uh, I think he beat Master. He got the only win in Third Strike. And I smoked the shit out of him, Marvel. So we did all right. Super Turbo, eh, it's something that haunts me. I, I want to blame it on the mindset. Uh, Troy and Vi did really good Super Turbo. They both won three out of five. All I had to do was win three out of five, and we would have we would have won. But, uh, yeah, due to circumstances beyond the high control, kind of fucked it up. And uh, uh, I want to say I lost it for America. I I'll, I'll shoulder that blame. I have no problem shouldering that blame, but. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, yeah. Well, maybe you could tell that ST side of the story uh, on a future uh, Riz One podcast. I don't know if you're familiar, <laughs> but uh, Riz has started his own uh, ST podcast, Super Lore Boys. Shout outs to Super Lore Boys. I think, um, I think Riz has a podcast later today with El Trouble. So, uh, shout outs to Riz. Make sure you follow him on Twitch. Uh, also on Twitter, Riz is also on Twitter. Uh, Riz One. Also on Riz is not a, he's a bison player, right? That went to Canada Cup. Yeah, and, uh, yeah he's a bison he's, player, definitely. He's from New York, right? He was visiting here for a while? Yeah, he. Uh, I think he moved out. I think he moved. Um, I don't think he's in the West Coast anymore. Um, yeah, I think but, I met him when I talked to him for the first time in Canada a couple years ago. He's a really cool, really cool guy. Yeah. So, so like, aside from Third Strike you know, in Japan, I mean, what were some of the things? I mean, obviously, Japan in 2000 is probably a lot different from when I went, which was in 2017. But what are some of the things that uh, that stand out in your mind about your trip to Japan that aren't necessarily FGC related? Oh man, there's so many stories. Like we embarrassed ourselves a little bit. So I'm gonna tell a story. <laughs> it, it's pretty funny to me, and uh -huh. it's funny at the time. 
But it kind of, you know, I'm embarrassing myself by telling you, but I think it's entertainment, you know. But so there was a South Park episode of Chin Pokemon. I don't know if you know what that is, where they're where they're making fun of, you know, Pokemon and shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. So we're we're in the we're in the train and we're all talking and shit, right? Like, yeah, we're gonna get a bunch of girls here. They're gonna fucking, you know, show us up, you know, like we're from America, we're fucking and we were just talking shit, and then, I don't know, being a stupid little kid, I was like, yeah, because in South Park, they talked about big American penis, right? That was the fucking shit that the, you know, the, the Japanese were saying in South Park. So we're talking shit, we're like, yeah, we're going to show these girls what's up with the big American penis, and we're just, just being stupid fucking kids, right? Just being assholes. And then when we leave the train, right, there's this old Japanese couple, this the nicest, the nicest couple. You wouldn't even expect anything. They talked to us in English. They fucking understand English. They knew everything we were saying. And it was probably one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. And they're like, please enjoy your stay in Japan. And I was like, oh, fuck, <laughs> man. This is horrible. <laughs> it was just like, it was like this is what like, damn, I need to grow the fuck up, dude. <laughs> Shit, man. This is, this is a reality check. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, it reminds me to shut the fuck up sometimes and stop being stupid. And mm-hmm. just, yeah, overall, we had, a, we had a really fun time. Um, what else is memorable? Oh, so they set up a formal dinner for Team USA and Team Japan, right? There was a formal dinner mm-hmm. in like this high rise building. And the building's really odd. So the building is basically like four walls. The inside is completely empty. But it's like a business building and it's uh there's a lot of elevators and high stairs. So we're all dressed like shit, right? No one even tells us. We're coming straight from the arcade, we're all wearing like jeans, t shirt, and we've been walking around all day, so it's kinda of sweaty a little bit, you know, and we get there. All the Japanese are fucking in suits and ties and <laughs> oh my god, they just made it so stupid. Like I don't understand why this happened. Like this is something we still talk about to this day. Like we got embarrassed. Like pre-game, before the tournament, the night before, they take us out to dinner. No one tells us it's formal. No one tells us shit. And we go eat. And we're all dressed like shit going into a fucking nice restaurant. So then it, it gets worse, right? Like, so, you know, we're talking to everybody. Like, hey, how you doing? Everybody introduces himself. Uh, Kuni Funada was there. The the guy who ran our, our what's, what's that magazine over there? Arcadia Magazine or something like that? The guy with the crazy hair who looks like a rocker. That was the first time we got introduced to him. Um, just a lot of the a lot of the Japanese gamers were there. And so dinner comes. And we, dude. This is what probably been no shit, right? Where you go? Mm-hmm. They bring out the first course, and it's inside like this, uh, this wooden, like a wooden, like there's a ball inside, but it's inside this like wooden bamboo like thing to keep warm or whatever. And I'm sitting next to the shore, right? I lift up the lid a little bit, and I'm like, oh, oh, I cover it, and I'm like, Troy, there's some shit moving inside of my bowl. And I don't know what the fuck it is, dude. And he's like, shut the fuck up. I'm like, Troy, I don't want to open this again. <laughs> like, turns out, years, like, I didn't dare to open it, right? The whole time, I didn't know. I said, fuck that, right? It looked like the whole day or you didn't open it. You didn't open it at all. The whole. <laughs> uh-uh, uh-uh. But it looked like little worms on top of, mm-hmm. on top of the daikon or the potato, whatever it was, right? Uh-huh. And I didn't know. It was just shavings, right? It was just shavings, yeah. but it looked like. It looked like they are going to feed us fucking live worms. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Are you talking about the bonita flakes? Are you talking about like yeah, the bonita dude. flakes? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> I was worms back then, dude. I was shitting my pants fucking. So we're just like shit. They're feeding us some fucking crazy shit that's still moving. And back then, I never ate sushi in my life back then. <laughs> now it's like my top food, right? But yeah, I never ate raw food back then. We're dressed like fucking shit. We just got embarrassed in the arcade. Like, our whole fucking life is, like, just bringing new meaning to us at this point. We don't know what the fuck's going on, dude. It was mm-hmm. it's just the, the nuttiest experience, man. And it's just like, oh, my God. But, yeah, dude, it was just, it's weird. It's just a whole culture shock, man. It was just mm-hmm. so fun, but so different at the same time. So you come back from Japan, and uh, around the same time, 
you know, the uh, more and more uh, people in SoCal are playing Third Strike. You know, more specifically, right. you know, I'm talking about you know the people, uh, the players from the Valley, uh, the Family Fun Crew, or 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 the players that would later, you know, form into the Family Fun Crew. And I know we mentioned them a little bit earlier before, um, but when did you, or you know, when did you start? Like, how did you start noticing? you know, players like Vic and Gio and, and Pyro, like when did they start kind of coming into the scene? So uh, damn, I'm trying to, I'm trying to really pinpoint it. There was another, there was another tournament. I believe Wilson was throwing it. And what was that place called? Um, it was out in Van Nuys. It was out in Van Nuys and GR Rodriguez would go there. Frankie 3S would go there. Pyro would go there. Uh, Shadow Vic Lanes? No, no, it was a, it was like a little game. Like a, oh, it, it, it was, it was the, it was the, it was the game store that Wilson owned, right? Or he worked at, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, kind of by All Amusement. I don't know if you remember All Amusement. It was like mm -hmm. down the street from there in Van Nuys. Mm -hmm. So we we went there, and it was surprising. Like you know, Vic would bring his girlfriend. I don't know if you remember that Mayuko girl that plays Chun Li. Mm -hmm. Ali would go there. I went there. Who else? I don't remember. Like a lot of us would go there, and then uh, we would play. And I think Gio was better than all of us at that point in that game. Uh, Jr. was there. He was okay. He was just kind of a gimmick character. Um, who else was good though? Frankie was really good. Pyro wasn't Pyro yet. Um, Amir wasn't coming around yet. So yeah, the top two back then were like Gio, Frankie, Jr. Why was still good, but he wouldn't really travel too far outside of Orange County back then. Um, yeah, we just we we started getting a little more experience, and then and then they started talking a lot of shit, right? I don't know. Why. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you about that because again, this this all happened, you know, before I came into the scene, and so how did the you know from from your perspective, right? How did this rivalry between you know because 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 when I entered the scene right away right i didn't have to know anything about anybody but i could tell there was definitely you know some 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 uh some uh i guess uh, I, I don't know what you would call it but but there was some definitely a a, a good level of competitive fervor between kind of your group which was kind of like the southern hills golf fan group you and watson and, and don and, and and everyone and then the family fun crew, right? You had you had referenced a, a time when Pyro had challenged Valle, and I think he went all the way to to Southern Hills, because um, right. again, you know, for people who don't live in Cali, sometimes they forget how big Cali is. You know what I'm saying? Like like yeah. to drive from the Valley to Orange County is is uh, <laughs> is not yeah. is not like you know not like a quick ride. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's actually it's hour a and a half, trip. man. Bit of a trip, and that's without traffic. True. So, so yeah, these guys they, they were coming up. Uh, the funny but thing, but how did but how did how did, the, how did the how did the rivalry develop? Do you remember? Was it like just people talking smack on the forums, or you know, how do you? you know, there, was that? One time, there was one time Jr. Rodriguez came down with the like combo fiend, came down with Geo, all those guys, and we played a third strike tournament in Southern Hills Golf Line, which was a rarity. Mm -hmm. But he came and. Uh, he beat me in the tournament, and I go to shake his hand, and he didn't shake my hand. And I was like, oh, so it's like that, huh, you motherfucker? So then he went to go sit outside, and I'm like, what's up then? You know, like, this is when, that's a big sign of disrespect, you know? You're going to beat me, mm -hmm. and I'm already, like, going to shake your hand, and it's like, good game, bro, you know? And he didn't shake my hand. And I was Wait, like, he funny. beat you, or you beat him? Oh, he beat me. And he didn't shake your hand. Exactly. So that's okay. like, oh, okay, this motherfucker wants to do it like this, you know? And then I think that's when I actually started trying to get into the game. It's, it's because of family fun and because of JR. All their fucking bullshit. They thought they were hot. And I'm like, dude, these guys are fucking trash. You know, like, I know I could beat the shit out of these guys. And yeah, those, those days were, it was kind of funky, man. We went outside. I fucking, you know, I remember I turned them. And then they're like, hey, chill out. You know, I'm like, man, fuck this guy. He doesn't want to shake my hand. Like, fucking, he could. He can shake my foot out of his ass then if he wants to, you know, like I gave him a choice. And then it was just, it was kind of weird. And then uh, we became cool with everybody, but it, it took a really long time. Like there was a lot of fierce rivalries and mm -hmm. even like Paul Ian and stuff, like he was roommates with Victor Lee and Victor Lee's girlfriend would come over and then it would be like, my Yuko would literally beat 
Victor Lee, and he would get so mad because she would play her game weaker just to let him win, and he could kind of sense it, and that would piss him off even more. But I don't know what it was. Like, she had his number. It was so weird. And I can say that she's never beat me in tournament, but she's beat almost all those top guys in tournament before. And whether or not they were playing, you know, less than what their potential is, they still lost to her in tournament. So mm-hmm. it, it was just, it was really different. I don't know if you ever played against her, but she was playing chun me and it was really annoying back then. She was good. Oh, but no, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to wait to, to, to mention Mayuko, you know, for our third segment when we talk about Super Arcade. But I mean, I might as well, you know, mention her now. But you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I remember my Yuko very well. She, um, I first played her at at the old Super Arcade, the original Super Arcade. Um, she used to play there. Um, and interesting fact: the very first Necro tournament, the very first tournament that I played Necro in, was a some random two v two tournament at family one day. Um, you know, I started out with Ken. And then eventually I switched to Necro. And I remember the very first Necro tournament I played at, at Family. It was a 2v2. And I got second. And my partner was Mayuko. <laughs> it was Necro and Shun. And first place was Pyro and Five Star. Um, right. And that was the very first Necro tournament I, I, I played at Family Fun. And uh, Mayuko carried my ass <laughs> with that Shun. <laughs> Um, um, but sure. she also played a buki too. I remember uh-huh. she played a buki, um, and I think she was a Counter Strike player. Like it was, I I never knew Mayuko personally, but and I know a lot more women are getting into the FGC. You know, getting into F- Street Fighter and fighting games. Um, but I could honestly, you know, tell you, and you know, I don't know, you know, who believes this or not, but like Mayuko was so good. Like, you just kind of forgot she was a girl. At least that's kind of like when I re- remember playing her. Like, I just, it was just, it was, she was that good. You know? I give her credit. Like I said, I, I would just fucking just the show I was like, man, fuck this. I ain't never losing to a girl. So I made sure I played it 100% and I could just yeah. talk shit all the time to everyone who lost her, you know? But yeah. she, she earned her victories for sure. She was fucking good. And then when I later learned that she was dating Vic, I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) I get it now. Um, But yeah, and so family starts coming up. And then that's kind of when I came into the scene, when I started to, you know, uh, I I first learned about family at UCI. Um, I was playing Third Strike at the Zod Zone, which was our college arcade. And 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 then Five Star happened to be there. Um, you know, well, well, that's not what I'm saying, Ramses. It's just, you know, back in the day, again, we were products of our own time and environment. But in the arcade days, not a lot of women played, were in the arcades. You know, they weren't playing Street you know, Fighter. She's the only girl that would even touch the game. There was zero was, girls that would. The, the, no one really played. You know, and again, th- that, that's for a variety of reasons. But, you know, it was very, you know, it, it was, it, it was, it was very uncommon. Um, and, and, and I don't think a whole lot of people know, uh, the story of Mayuko. Um, um, but, but they should, because, you know, she was definitely a, a very strong third strike player, you know, for, for, for that I era. Her, I give her a question. She's a top 10 player for sure, for sure back then. Yeah. But, she knew um, what she was doing. She was definitely not a butt master. She could hit confirm. She knew what she was doing. But, you know, that initial reaction, right? Well, it's like, you know, when we were, you know, back in the, back when we were growing up, when a girl would, those very few times when a female would come up to the Street Fighter cab. I mean. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You know, it, it, it almost never happened, let alone, did you know, a, a, a player, you know, who was, who was, you know, strong and you know, who, was, who knew how to play the game. So it was, it was, it was super. She was literally the first woman that I played Third Strike against you know like like at all uh whether it was casually or whatever but yeah going back to uh you know going back to the family fun scene you know i i I first learned about family fun uh in 2000 you know around late 2002 um i was at my college arcade zod zone and you know five star happened to be there um i think he was visiting his girlfriend at the time at uci and then he told me about family fun and then kind of like the rest is history um, 
And that's kind of when I started to kind of get a sense of, okay, here's the FGC. Like, there are these arcades. Like, to me, growing, you know, coming up, you know, like, entering the scene in the early 2000s, like, it was very, like, territorial, right? Like, it was kind of the arcades. Like, what arcade were you repping? Um, and- it's got to be Gotham, you know, because the manager was super cool, guy named Jacob Balon, he gave us tokens. He would take care of us, you know? He would make sure the top players were taken care of, so we stay there, and we were, like, the attraction for mm-hmm. other people to come. He knew what he was doing. He was one of the first few, but he was one of the first, one of the few that actually cared, too. Like, mm-hmm. he really gave a shit. He made sure all the machines were in working order. Before the tournament, he would make sure everything was, like, brand new and cherry and fixed. Like, he he was a top-tier tech, but he was also someone that really, really gave a shit, and that's that's something that people don't talk about when it comes to someone loving their job and stuff. He loved the community. Like, he was one of the first older people that was never in the scene, that was never involved, but he understood that it meant something to us. And Vai worked at the arcade, too, so I'm sure I'm sure he fed off and picked Vai's brain a little bit, too. And mm-hmm. you know, he, he, he understood that we loved this shit, and he did his best to give us the perfect environment to play in. And mm-hmm. we're, we're in debt to him for that, for sure. He's an awesome dude. Mm-hmm. So speaking of like, you know, kind of the scene being a lot really territorial, you know, what were some of the, uh, I, I'm going to mention some, some, some names of arcade venues and, you know, I wanted you, and I want you to, 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 to let me know, you know, what are some of the things that come to mind, you know, as far as third strike goes. So, you know, let, 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 let's just get it out of the way. Let's start with family, right? Family fun arcade. Oh, as far as third okay. strike goes. They have some good players, but for the most part, their fucking heads are so far up their ass that it's just, it's amazing. Like, they, I think they really stunted the growth of the scene just because of just the way they approached it. You know, they were very, very unwelcoming. They talked a lot of shit and uh, they were, I hate using the term, but they were the first Japanese dick riders in America, like straight up. What do, you mean by that? what do you mean by that? Dude, they wanted to be Japanese so bad, you know? They wanted to be Japanese so bad. They made all their machines head-to-head. They, uh... How do you say it? They wanted to play, like, single elimination tournaments. Like, all that shit, they tried to just... They tried to X-copy the Japanese tournament scene in that sense. It's like, mm-hmm. there was no originality. There was nothing. It's just, like I said, just by them making all their machines head-to-head... You could already tell there's a different social aspect to the game for them. Like, I myself hated head-to-head because I grew up playing side-by-side. I play off the feel of another player, and I can, mm-hmm. I can feel when they're intimidated. I can feel when they're nervous. I can feel when they're aggressive. Like, you can just feel it. Whereas when you play head-to-head, I feel like I'm playing against the robot, and, like, it, it takes away a lot of motivation for me. It's kind of weird, like... I feel like I'm just playing against a, a, a high-level computer, and it's just, it's not the same, you know? Like, like I was telling you earlier, Street Fighter is like an intimate situation where it's a one-on-one battle, you know, and you're like feeling out the opponent. And but but you could always, you, you could always glance at your opponent. You know, I'd be like, you know that you're playing somebody, though, right? And head-to-head. Yeah, but it's like, mm-hmm. look, at the, look at the Japanese lifestyle, right? They're very quiet. They don't interact much socially. You sit down, you put your coin in, you lose, you get up and walk away. Whereas... Whereas Street Fighter before, like, you see the person, if you're cool with them, hey, what's up, man, you know, blah, blah, blah. You you know, you just shoot the shit a little bit before the game starts, or you're talking during the game a little bit, or talking shit, you know, with them. Or when it's over, you can talk shit to them, like, ah, fuck you, fuck you up. But when it's, like, head-to-head, sometimes you don't even know who your opponent is, right? Let's say you're playing on the middle machines at Family Fun, you don't know who your opponent is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's, it's a total different feeling, and I felt like I felt like they were the new age of generation of not just players, but just the new generation of people and kids. And there was no social connect. Like Street Fighter was losing the social aspect of it while maintaining the competitive aspect. But you're losing like the friendships and the com- camaraderie and stuff like that. And I thought that was, I thought that was a big loss for the scene, actually. Hmm. So earlier on the podcast you had you you had admitted that you don't like playing on console or on ports um True. that you're 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 an arcade purist um but 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 that that was one of the main sources of 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 contention when it comes to you know the 3S 
you know, 3S at Evo, right? When it came to the family fun players. Like, from, from what I remember, um, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, the family members, you know, didn't really frequent Third Strike at Evo was because of the, 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 the situation with regard to the ports and stuff like that. So, you know, you had mentioned earlier that you, you yourself don't like playing on ports. You don't like playing on console versions. Um, and then, you know, and, and that's kind of the reason why the family players, you know, really didn't want to or, or weren't fond of competing at Evo. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the reason why you play Third Strike is because of the competition. So can you kind of explain to, 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 you know, explain to me kind of how, you know, what your mindset was in that regard? Like, because I know there was a lot of back and forth with regards to, you know, family fun players not showing up to Evo and stuff like that. But it seems like the both of you were on the same page as far as not playing on consoles. So, see, but here's the thing with Family Fun: they didn't want to travel anywhere outside of Family Fun, period, right? Except maybe Dungeon. They wouldn't want to go to like Zot Zone. They wouldn't want to go to any like other tournaments, like anywhere. It was either Family Fun or nothing to them, and they felt like they were so. They felt like they were just better than everyone else in every sense. Not even just like they, they just felt like they were superior to everyone. You know, it's kind of. It was kind of gross, like the mentality. And they were in their own little bubble, and they would hype each other up so much. And like I said, there were some good players. Definitely, there were some good players. Best player in America in third strike, Pyro. Pass down. I think Shen's a close second, and I think Amir's right there. But you got Amir, Pyro, then you got Frankie. Like, all those guys are sick, right? They're top, top 10 players in America. But they never wanted to travel outside. And, like, home court advantage is huge, obviously, but. I felt like they just, they talked the talk, but they never walked the walk. And here's the thing. When they have like SBO quads at family and stuff, they put the machine next to each other. So it's no longer head to head. And I would do shitty at the randats, right? When it's head to head. But when the SBO quads came around, it was a whole different story. I would beat the player that I matched up against most of the time, whether it be Frankie, whether it be Ricky, who was on their team. I beat a lot of players during those tournaments. And the sad thing is, it was three on three. It was usually me, Paul Lee, and Hung B. I don't think there was one SBO qual where all three of us got to play on the same team, which is it's a little disheartening, you know? Like, we got to play. There was two of us. And we always had a random third that was kind of, eh. It was a decent player, but it wasn't good enough. Like, they knew what they were doing. They would throw us, they would throw us the, the last pick of the pile, and they knew we were at a huge disadvantage. And, there's a lot of bullshit that went on like during those tournaments, but I know for a fact that like like even Yi Wang, he doesn't want to ever admit that I'm a good player, right? Like he he calls me like the best scrub he's ever seen or the sloppiest fucking best player or whatever. But me and him teamed up for Evo two on two one year. So if you want someone to team up with, you know there's a respect there. Like you respect the other person game. He's not gonna just team up with some random dude. So it's just shit like that. But I really think they held back, like, they they put in the effort to study the game. They actually, <laughs> and they they almost kidnapped the Japanese when they came here, right, from from Japan, like, for evil and stuff. They would, like, you know, hoard them and, like, force them to play, like, day and night nonstop, which, which was cool. They became friends with them, and they had a different relationship. But by them not competing at Evo and not willing to adapt, I think that kind of that kind of slowed down that game. And, like I said, they just wanted to play only in family and they wanted to keep it there. I think that really that really just kind of killed everything. They weren't willing to step outside. Whereas for me, I would look for competition. I would go almost anywhere. And even though I hate head to head, I still competed in quite a few rad bats just because, you know, just keep the scene alive and just for the sake of competition, just have fun, you know. But their unwillingness to, to step outside and their their thought of their own superiority kinda they kinda killed themselves in that aspect of I really he maxed his potential I think Amir Amir was willing to you know do whatever it took he maxed his potential but there were players like Frankie and and uh there's a guy named Adolfo who's a really good player he never yeah man Hugo him. player Rodolfo yeah man Dude, Adolfo is the best pairing machine to ever play third strike outside of tournament I don't know if you agree with that. You mean, or not, you, mean, you mean the best, the best at pairing during casual matches? Is that what you're talking exactly. About? He is the number one pairing machine in the world. I, I'll give him that title outside of tournament. 
That's like Frankie. Right. Frankie, on the other hand, is the best in-game parrying machine I've ever seen in my life. This guy, I don't know why, right? Like, Combo Fiend plays Elena. And this, this stands out for some reason. This one tournament stands out for some reason. Mm-hmm. Frankie versus Combo Fiend. Elena versus Ryu. Combo Fiend goes to do a low strong into the Elena, what is it, number two super? The one that goes towards you and does all the knees and bullshit? Yeah, Brave Dance, yeah. And Frankie, for some reason, who the fuck knows why? For some reason, he knows how to parry this entire fucking super hit for hit, no problem, and full punish. Mm. And why, why would you know how to parry this? I don't understand. Yeah, I think it's it's ours, man. It's just all the time that the the family fun players put in the game. Like you know, just coming from my perspective, um, like I said before, I already knew there was some uh, competitive uh, fire between family and, and your crew. But you know, as a newcomer in the scene, man, I just you know, I just kind of soaked it all in and just kind of like clearly like just like the 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 level of play. You know that I was, that, you know that I was witnessing was just was just great, and you know I'm like you, man. I mean, I like competition. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not basket weaving, right? We're not knitting. We're playing Street Fighter at the end of the day, mm-hmm. and I think you know the competition is really important. And you know, we're we're gonna talk a little bit more about your 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 your, your history with the family fun players uh, later on, uh, you know, towards the end of the podcast. But let's talk a little bit about some other arcades. Let's talk about let's talk about Camelot. Because Camelot is an arcade that's very close to my heart. Um, because, you know, around, you know, when, when I graduated from UCI, I, I went to grad school uh, at Cal State Fullerton, which was about like a five minute drive from Camelot. Uh, mm-hmm. And I lived like real close to Camelot too. And so I started going there. Um, and then, you know, I started going there pretty regularly. Me, Marvin, Paul, Ken I, Mike D, uh, 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 Ghetto uh, Don. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and then you would show up sometimes, you know, like I'm talking about like 2000. 4 2005 you, you know you 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 were kind of showing up less and less but what do you remember about Camelot cuz i remember I'm, you know after southern hills closed it was like okay what's left i remember the first player stick would suck most of the time <laughs> yeah and i hate to be an asshole and admit this but the tech would never fix it right he'd come over there he'd wiggle it around and yeah we'd go up down that right right but obviously <laughs> it wasn't up to standard uh huh Dude, I remember, I, I don't know if you remember doing this, but I remember every time I saw you come to family, you had a bottle of WD-40 on you. <laughs> maybe, can I compress there? Maybe. I, re- I actually remember seeing you. I-, I hope I don't get any, I get you in trouble, but I probably won't, right? But like, I remember seeing you during a game, like it was in between games, you're actually spraying WD-40 into the the the, the joystick, right? Or in the hole. To kind of yeah. loosen it up. Or <laughs> well, a lot of times the buttons are sticky too, right? And like, yeah. they would never clean it because there's like gum residue and shit. And these stupid texts, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> but, so, uh, but the worst is the, uh-huh. stick was, the stick was never broken, right? So uh-huh. I would be forced to take one of the fucking stools and fucking bash the fucking stick down so it's broken. And then the tech would finally fix it. And I think okay. after like three times, he finally understood, uh-huh. oh, these guys aren't going to put up with this shit anymore. I better really fucking change it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think after that, it was pretty cool. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's broken now, bitch. So how do you like it? Because I remember at Camelot, you know, there, w- there was a lot of weekly tournaments going on, especially when Southern Hills closed down because there was really nowhere else to go. And like, I think we, we ran Third Strike basically every week for like a good year and yeah, a half almost. CBS 2 and Super Turbo because all three were next to each other, remember? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, some of my fondest memories about Camelot, like I said before, like I kind of call them the Camelot crew because that's kind of who I saw as the regulars. But of course, you know, myself, you know, Mr. Universe, Pauly, Ghetto D, Ken I, Mike Burke. You remember Mike Burke? <laughs> Angry Mike. You know, Hung would come out. Let, let's talk a little bit about Hung, actually. I mean, he's someone that I hope I can get on the podcast sometime in the future. But where did Hung come from, man? Because, like, it, it didn't seem like he kind of almost, like, again, like, he kind of he kind of almost burst onto the scene kind of almost out of nowhere. Um, well, it was an Because there were, there were really no Oro mains, right, at the time in SoCal. Zero. There was yeah. zero. So there was an SBO qualifier at Camelot. 
I don't know if you went to that or not, but this is another. <laughs> there's another drama infested Uh-oh. fucking third strike results. This is when Uh-oh. Paul Lee qualified. I don't know if you talked about it on his podcast. Oh, are you talking about the one where he banged the machine or, or he banged on the buttons when Vic? Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. SBL. I wasn't the there. there. I wasn't there. The panel and distracted Vic on one parry that cost him the whole match to go to Japan. Well, well, I mean, to be to to be fair, I think what Paul clarified is there was already he was Vic was already down, and so he still had to. He, you know, it wasn't like the last last game. That's yeah, but you still don't said. you don't pull that kind of shit. You know, come on, man! Like jumping out of your chair, pushing the panel a little bit. It's like, dude, come on, man. Okay, so, this, so Paul, Paul claims he Paul claims he never moved the cab. So He's were you pulling. there? Well, <laughs> He's I was right there next to him. He's full of shit. Oh, 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 okay. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sort that out, you know. <laughs> hey, me and Vic were never the best of friends, so hey, it is what it is, man. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, another arcade, um, and I kind of mentioned it earlier uh, in the podcast, but let's talk a little bit about Arcade Infinity because Arcade yeah. Infinity to me was kind of like because again, back when we were coming up in the scene. You know, back in the early 2000s, really it was arcade parts, right? Like nowadays, right? Everyone wants Japanese parts, Japanese sticks, and so forth yeah. and so on. But back then, no one wanted to play on Japanese sticks. So in a weird way, AI was really not all that big of a hotspot at first when it right. came to Street Fighter. But did you ever go there every now and then to play Third Strike or anything else? Because it was pretty close, right? I went to AI only mm-hmm. after Street Fighter 4 came out. Mm-hmm. And I went there to try it out and... I'm a real big arcade like fan, and for some reason their monitor lagged. Like there was like a full one second lag between the time you hit a button and what came out. And I don't know how they dealt with it. I tried to talk to Scott at the time, and it just it was a big turnoff. That was why I kind of quit Street Fighter was because people accepted lag at that point, right? Like you would play on monitors. There's input lag. They would play at this place called Dream Lab in uh, in Arcadia. Mm-hmm. And all the setups were on laggy monitors. And I'm just like, how the fuck do you guys deal with this? Like, this is a, a pure reactionary game. I'm trying to whip punish you, and you're just fucking doing auto dialing combos, and you don't even care. You're just playing flow chart shit, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. I just felt the game got real dumbed down at that point. And it, it just it turned me off to fighting games in general. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, dude, I just I, I stepped away from the competitive scene just because of that. I went to one Evo for Street Fighter Four. And I wasn't really ready. Just ran into some bad matchups. Got fucked up by a Bison and just different stuff like that. But I, I hate lag. Like I just I can't stand lag. And I, I think lag really killed killed a lot of things. And I think people just being acceptive of online gaming now, where there is lag, they just accept it. And I don't know. It's just not Street Fighter anymore. Like it's a pure reaction game. And now you're just you're turning it into a, a guessing game or a flowchart game instead of a game based off reaction. And, my game was never. My game wasn't built around that, so just it kind of just went away from my style. I refused to. I refused to learn a different way to play just to accommodate their shittiness of not having good online play. I guess so. Mm-hmm. It's just weird. So l- let's turn to your Evo history because, you know, on paper, you know, y- you have probably one of the more impressive Third Strike resumes in Evo history as far as American players go. Um, you know, I think you've competed in, you know, every scheduled Dirt Strike exhibition at EVO. Um, again, you know, you, you competed in the first U.S. versus Japan over in, 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 to- in, in Japan. Um, you competed in the famous EVO 2K2 3S exhibition. Remember when Tokido debuted all these, those unblockables, uh, on yeah. Justin? You were in that, you were in that exhibition. Um, and then 2K4, right? That's, Obviously, everyone remembers that as the Daigo Perry. Um, that Evo is uh, uh, really important to me because that was the first Evo that I competed in. Um, but it's also a really special Evo for you uh, because I believe, you know, in 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 the J- the, the Japanese era, right? Like, or or even in Evo history, uh, you know, you're 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 like there were so many Japanese players. That came to California, to, to came to SoCal for Evo 2K4. Right. 
third strike Japanese players. So many that remember we ran, you know, family ran its own kind of tournament, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and everyone was there. It was just that whole weekend was just amazing. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a for a better first Evo experience. You know, going to family and then going to Cal Poly, um, but you know that was also the first year where Evo switched to super guns. And I remember there was a big uh. There was some, uh, there, there was some, uh, some uh, contention with that, and so there was just so much revolving around Evo. Like it would be really cool to kind of do like a podcast just on Evo Two K Four, right? Right. But but you know, just kind of your experience in Evo Two K Four. Um okay. A lot of Art. people remember. A lot of people remember you. You know, Two K Four with you defeating Mester and getting it to top eight. Um. You know, you, uh, you and Justin were the, you know, the, I think, I think, I think was Shen in top Shen eight as well. It. Yeah. Shen so, so, it. so there were, so you, Shen and Watson made top eight at Evo 2K4. Uh, and again, you, you made top, one of the reasons you made top eight is because you, you defeated Mester. And you had mentioned earlier that you had waited like six, seven years for your revenge. Yeah. So right? for starters, me and Troy picked up all those players from Japan at the airport. Okay. <laughs> So, so all those players, we can thank me and Troy for doing that shit. We did that as payback for the hospitality in Japan towards us. I rented a fucking expedition so I could mm-hmm. fit all those fuckers in one ride, and we picked them up from Japan or from the airport when they came from Japan. Mm-hmm. Now, did you did you guys play them like before the tournament, or did you guys play any at all? Or uh, honestly, not much, because like I said, they're third strike players, right? And we didn't really uh-huh. care for third strike, uh-huh. and. I mean, in all honesty, I don't remember exactly, but I probably wasn't in the mood to get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those guys, they were on another level for sure, but mm-hmm. yeah, the, the, the memorable experience was I beat Mester. I waited seven years to beat him, and I beat him two out of three, so there's no fluke, and mm-hmm. it was just, I don't know, man. And the, the sad thing is, me gloating over another man's suffering, but after the match, after the match, mm-hmm. Mester balled up like a little baby, oh, and no. KSK was KSK was holding him like he's a little little boy, and Mester was crying, and KSK it's okay, it's okay, and then dude. So is that is that true? Mester actually cried after you beat him. I put it on my kids that Mester cried because I beat his ass that time. Wow. Now, yeah. Am I a better player than Mester? No. But well, you were a better you were a better player in that set. That, that's that, <laughs> and he was doing. Some, if you watched the whole three match, he was doing some cheap ass shit, dude. Mm-hmm. Genai Jin is the most broken super, like, in any game, mm-hmm. dude. He was mm-hmm. he would activate. He would do universal overhead to get me block where I got a block high, and then he would go into a low right away. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything. What the fuck can you do? You're eating it for sure. Like you're just fucked. So I I think this might be the last game. I'm not really sure. I mean, I was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I watched the match and just the the response because, again, you know, this is two K four for the last four almost five years. Clearly, the Japanese have demonstrated their dominance in third strike, right? Like it was just no one gave Americans a chance. So when you when you were able to beat Mester, I mean, what was going well? Well, before you know. Before the match, what was, what was your mentality going coming in before the match? So here's the funny thing. Mm-hmm. Mester played Daigo the match before this. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like I'm one of the best Shoto versus Shoto players in any game, any Street Fighter game. I feel like I can win that match just off pure knowledge and footsies and comfort. Mm-hmm. And I hate Yun. So I was cheering so hard for Daigo to win because at that point, Mester was like the number one player in the world, right? In third strike. Mm-hmm. He wrote FAQs that are literally like thick as phone books on his character. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, Daigo's going to lose. I'm going to fuck Daigo up and I'm going to make top eight, which would have changed the whole history of Street Fighter, right? Because there's no more 37. <laughs> None of that would have existed, right? Mm-hmm. But instead, Daigo wins and I'm just like, God damn it, right? I'm like, Fuck, I gotta play this motherfucking cheap ass young. Fuck! Mm-hmm. So then we're playing. And then I'm feeling now, I'm like, oh shit. I can win this. I'm playing super solid. Mm-hmm. I'm so focused. 
I was like, fuck, man, I'm playing, I'm playing above my normal level. I'm just real comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I win the first game. And then I lose the second game. Like, fuck. So third game, he wins the first round. Second game, I beat him pretty bad in the second round. Or the third game, second round. And then third game, I get him in the corner and I just pummel the shit out of him. And I win. And then I hear Yi going, yeah. And then fucking Henry sends like looking at him like, dude. And like, but no one's really watching this match because everybody's watching Ricky and Shen in the corner because they're already assuming I'm going to lose. Mm-hmm. But I'm so glad because back then people didn't record matches too much. But there's this guy, Vism. I don't know if you know who that is. Yeah, man. Vism, yeah. Vism recorded our match. And I was so thankful because there was no. There was no YouTube yet. The Google video was brand new, and he uploaded it on Google video for me, actually, because YouTube was not even around, right? Mm-hmm. And I got to watch my match, and I was gloating for it. And my name on Steam was I Beat Mester for like five years. Because <laughs> I, so I was so proud of that moment, dude. That might be my proudest victory. Like, after all the time, I, that might be my proudest, proudest victory is beating Mester in that game because he was the best at the time. And he fucked me up in his town, and he came back here, and I got my revenge, and it was just, it was, it was sweet fucking revenge. Mm-hmm. It was sweet revenge. No, no, no. Okay, eternally, forever? Yeah, that, that little scar on your heart, Mester, I did that to you. <laughs> so, so Mester has that Sagat scar? That's right. Courtesy yeah. of the, of, of, of the Watson. I think you yeah. hit, I think you hit him. Actually, n- n- now that we're talking about it, can you tell me a little bit about the Watson? Because you, you, you're, you know that you're immortalized when you have like a maneuver named after you, right? Like the so, finish, so you're aware, was- you're you're aware that the universal overhead and to shore you, right? With Ken, yeah. that's that's the yeah. Watson. Yeah. So, so where the did that come from? That is even better. Yeah, yeah, that's the advanced Watson. But what, what, where did that where did that come from? Because people to this day use the Watson. Right. So if you do a universal overhead, people uh-huh. are like jittery at the end of the game, right? Most players they're on they're on high alert, their tensions are real high, the parry timing's a little off. So when you do a universal overhead, most likely they're guessing high or low on a move. And the move's not hitting them yet because the hit the hitbox is not there yet. So they're gonna get hit by the universal overhead, and if that doesn't kill them, they're left with like nothing. Now you do a chip damage with the fierce uppercut and Regardless, of, they're not gonna they're not gonna parry after getting hit by a universal story. Like that's it's just it's not it's not in your mental game unless you're really really ready for it. But it's just so awkward, you know. There's like a gap in timing on a parry. Like it takes away for me, it took away the 50-50 for them because it created a, a space gap where now they're stuck blocking. But when you're scared, you're not gonna be able to block. When you're scared, you're trying to do something or you hit a button and mm-hmm. the universal story is gonna stuff your hit or it's gonna hit you fucking. Overhead when you're blocking low because you're scared, or it's it's gonna hit you when you're trying to parry, and then you just go for the fear cut for the final chip damage, or for the final the final hit if they hit a button. Mm-hmm. It's just a really good ender during a during a really like, sketchy sketchy moment like that. So Mester would get a little bit of revenge, right? Because because you guys did play next year in the Team USA versus Japan exhibition in Evo Two K Five, which was and the was- first Evo in 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 Vegas. Okay, so here's the problem with that, okay? So yeah. here's some drama that I need to apologize for. Okay. So they put Justin and Shin on that team automatically, right? Because they got top eight the previous year. So I was like, hey, what the fuck about me? Mm-hmm. I need top eight that year. How come mm-hmm. I'm not auto-qualified? So I had a sense of entitlement, right? I'm an asshole. It's just a competitive spirit at that point. And I was like, and I was on the fuck family fun fucking train too. So those guys... Those guys were playing really sick out here, right? The game, all of them leveled up. Ken I was good. Vic was good. Fucking. So it would have been, it's, it was supposed to be Ken I, Vic, Justin, Chen, and fuck, I don't, oh, Ricky. Ricky was really good too at that point. It was supposed to be those five. Mm-hmm. So it was family fun. And we're, we're supposed to have a playoff, right? Troy's in charge of. Troy was in charge of that. For some reason, it was Troy and Wizard. And then I was like, and then I saw Vic playing. And like, dude, I hadn't played for like months, right? I was like, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to be Vic, blah, blah, blah. And then I saw Vic playing. I'm like, oh, dude, this guy's fucking playing sick right now. Fuck that. So then I called Troy. I'm like, hey, bro, 
I'm not gonna play. Fuck that, dude. I'm taking the spot. <laughs> Fuck, dude. It was so fucked up. Like, like now that now that it's all over, it's like, dude, I should have let him have the spot because I didn't practice. I wasn't in game shape. It was he earned it. But I was just mad that like, why are they including fucking shit and Justin and saying their top eight is the excuse and I made top eight and I don't get the automatic spot. I was, mm-hmm. it was just bitter at that point and I took it out on Vic because we didn't really get along anyways and. It's just drama between family fun, but the the reality is I should have let it play. I was an asshole about it, and I I, I kind of regret it. Mm-hmm. Once again, we're having a few technical difficulties, but we should get uh, Mike back. There you go. Yeah, but as, well, 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 as a man, I, as a well, man like, I can it, say, it, hey, I'm sorry, dude. I made a mistake. My ego got in the way, and uh-huh. I should have let Vic play. And I think that kind of changed. I think that kind of changed the course of Third Strike for a while because, mm-hmm. like, uh, I don't know, he kind, of, he kind of quit after that, you know? Like, he wasn't really fully into the game anymore after that. And I, I, feel, I feel a little bad for that. But also, during the middle of the tournament, I tried to go up and talk to him, and he wouldn't talk to me. So then, mm-hmm. like, like, legit, I was going to tell him, hey, you want to take my spot? You can have it. You deserve it. And I had the power to do that back then, right? I have, I have power to evil. But he was just an asshole, you know? <laughs> like... I don't know how else to put it. He just acted like a prick. And rightfully so. You know, I was a dick too. So he was a dick in return. And But it just so happened that, hey, if we kind of talked it out, if he was cool at that moment just for that one second, I would hey, take my spot. You deserve it. I don't deserve it. And I would have given it to him at that moment. But it didn't happen. And it's something that, you know, it's something I'm not proud of. But I can, like I said, I can be a man and say sorry. And, you know, whether or not he forgives me, that's on him. But, mm-hmm. That's how, it, that's how it should have gone down. And then I think I got perfect in like three or four times in that fucking <laughs> that exhibition. So it was kind of mm-hmm. shitty. That's probably the shittiest turnout for me ever. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, to be fair, you know, it's kind of to play devil's advocate. You should never have been put in that position in the first place, right? Like if 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 the if the if the Evo if 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 the cannons were like, okay, this is why Shien and Vi are on the team, then that's not really on you. Right, like if if they if they say this is why they're on the team, then of course you're of course you should be on the team too if that's the rule. Um, but, yeah, but you know, back but then, I understand back where you're going. Of the city, you know, like mm-hmm. you got to remember, I was kind of like I'm not a co-founder of Evo, but I've been there since the beginning. Yeah, and we were all friends, so we all have power. You know, we can kind of manipulate the system, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of nepotism involved. You know, you want something, you're going to get it if you really want it. And like I said, I showed up. I saw he was playing really good, and I was like, man, fuck no, I ain't going to play him right now because he's probably going to win. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, it shouldn't have gone down, but that's how it went down, and it, it sucks, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that's what happened. So next year, you also participated in, in, in an exhibition that was uh, sort of mirrored in a little bit of controversy as far as you're concerned as well. Um, Evo 2K6, um, I think that we had set up uh, like a, a West Coast versus East Coast versus Texas mm-hmm. uh, exhibition. I don't even know if it all finished, but I think at some point it was decided that there would be two West Coast teams, and um, you and I ended up on uh, West Coast too. Um, I'm not sure who else was on our team, um, I but, think we, Ryan. but 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 from what what I recall, you definitely felt like it was a. Um, I don't know if you follow wrestling at all, Watts, but it, uh, it, it seemed like you felt like you were being put on the uh, the NWO B team, like the yeah, <laughs> man, like the, not the Wolf Pack. You were you, you were uh, you were put in the lesser NWO team, right? I'm like fucking Hulk Hogan, which I don't, which I don't take it, which, yeah, which I don't take it fence, right? Because I had, I had been playing the game what like two years or whatever, whatever, but like two three years. But I was like, from my end, I was like, yeah, we need some. We need some. <laughs> we need somebody on our team. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, but but, but tell us a little bit. Time, of, right? Yeah, but they tell us a little team, bit about how that exhibition East. came about, if you remember. So they have Team East Coast against Team West Coast, right? West Coast mm-hmm. one, we'll call it. Mm-hmm. East Coast beats West Coast one. Okay, so now Team East Coast plays West Coast two, which is us, right? And the things that stand out are. I remember our team got beat up pretty bad, and I was, I think I was an anchor. And then I, I run through two guys. I don't remember who they are. I'm, I'm sorry. And then I run into KO Fiend, mm-hmm. who was the second to last player. 
and he kicks my ass first round. Mm-hmm. And then second round, it's a little bit closer, but then he has a chance to win, and he tries to fucking showboat and parry my super, and I'm playing Chun-Li. Mm-hmm. And he fucking dies, right? So he's like all cocky. And then third round, I'm just, I beat the shit out of him, because now he's like, he lost his mental edge. And now I'm pissed off because he tried to showboat on me. So I just beat the fuck out of him third round. And then I go to play Justin for the final match. Mm-hmm. And then it's a Chun Chun we here with Justin. And mind you, Justin beats me every year at Evo, Ken Chun. And it's about like, just like last game, last round, no energy every fucking time, right? It's so close between me and him. So we're playing Chun Chun. And I beat Justin. I should have beat him all three. I should have beat him first two rounds, but he got lucky and he threw me out of a super somehow. At the end of second round. Mm-hmm. So third round, I dominate him. And then it's like, it's just such sweet victory because Team West Coast won. They handpicked their fucking team. And they got beat by Team East Coast. And then did, they, did, 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 did West Coast 1 lose to, uh, to East Coast? I'm pretty sure they did. Because I thought they played Texas. You think Texas beat them? I'm not sure, dude. Because I don't know if and, they even played East Coast. Because I, I, I don't... I don't. I don't even remember what the rules were. I don't know if it was like a tournament thing or it was a round robin, but uh, I, think, I do. I, I do see, know West Coast one played Texas. I think. I can see Ko Fiend beating everybody, and I can see Justin beating everybody on West Coast one. But I can't really see anyone on Texas beating Team West Coast. You know what I mean? Like no disrespect, but it's just. I think the skill gap was really big at that point. Well, then again, to be fair though, Shan did beat Amir though, right? At uh, I think it was the year after when they had their money. No, match. that was a money match, dude. Yeah. I, like, is there footage of that? It was yeah, on a right? big screen. I'm pretty sure there is. I'm pretty sure you could find Shen versus Amir yeah. Evo. But right now we're watching uh, your mirror match uh, versus Justin. Once again, this is from Evolution 2006. It was a Team West Coast versus uh, Team uh, East Coast. And uh, myself and Watson. I don't know who else was on our team, Watts. Um, all I remember is I do remember losing to KO Fiend. That's for sure. Uh, and then I think you went and, and beat him. And then I think this is the last match here. So, um, so yeah. So, uh, I think you're, uh, I think you're Blue Chun. Um, I think. I'm not sure. Uh so I remember, you know, from this exhibition, Watson, I remember, like, the, the moment you busted out car grab, like, we were like, oh, damn, okay. <laughs> we're just like, yeah, right, like, right there, we're just like, you could hear everyone in the background, whoa. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you, oh, well, whatever. Yeah. You just get lucky right here, dude. Look at this shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> well, you did miss a you did miss a whiff punish earlier, so you know you you, you had that round still. But th- this goes to third round here, really even, right? Like both of you have like exact same meter. Like we have the same style of play. It's just yeah. Justin as he got older, he got better, you know. Like, but we we we're both safe players, you know. Hit confirm. Oh, did you confirm that? Oh my god, PS two. Okay, it's a little faster. I like it. I'm gonna go back for some meter. Let me get my meter, buddy. Get the fuck away from me, dude. This was. Now I'm trying to avoid him getting two meters. So even if I keep one, I still have a lead. Mm-hmm. I gotta be careful. Yeah, this is this is basically your match to lose at this point. It's pretty tense. But one chunky. Oh, oh, oh! Yeah, tell you the truth, I was actually trying to eat it before it got too late. Like even oh. if. I knew at that point, even if I ate it, I'll be safe still, so I wasn't too worried. I'm trying to think what, what with Chun, what can you punish blocked EX spinning bird with? EX spinning, uh, EX, EX kicks, EX spinning bird too. There's got to be something you can punish with. Crouching jab, I'm pretty sure you can punish with crouching jab. If you can Got him. Got him. Yeah. Was- yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't recall... You know, again, w- w- the full results of that exhibition, but I do know it was put together on SRK, and I do know there were two West Coast teams, and um, yeah, that was definitely a memorable moment at Evo Two K Six when you were able to beat Justin. Like I said before, like when you busted out the car grab, like everyone was like, "Oh," you know, like we were all just surprised for some reason. We we're just like, "Oh well, okay." Watson came to play, so so we come to the end of your Evo career, uh, Watts. 
Um, you make top eight for a second time at Evo 2K8. And, um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, your, not, your performance notwithstanding, I, I think one of the, w- one of the bigger reasons why, um, this Evo is, is, is somewhat popular is because this is, uh, when you gave your, your, your infamous pre Evo interview. Uh, <laughs> if you remember Watson, uh, um, that was, that was pretty funny. Uh, but I don't know if anyone remembers, uh, Watson's pre, uh, pre Evo interview right here. The sound is so low on this video, though. I'm trying to watch uh, it. Really so I really didn't put in so much practice, and these kids play every day, and they still can't beat me. And I hear him yelling in the back, oh, he's old, and ain't 1994 anymore. Well, son, you ain't in top eight. Sorry. I really like Third Strike, because... Who am I kidding? Third Strike sucks. This game's so fast. <laughs> People that play this There's game, no the they parry mode, training mode, they still suck. And if they just keep whiffing everything, and I'll just hopefully just dominate them. Just because they don't know what's going on and just make them cringe and play out of their character, that's all. Well, there's no real hostility, but uh, hope you bring your A game. Because mm-hmm. if not, you're going to get How many people can say that on the, the big screen? For throwing Evo and, uh, they fucking say, fuck you, fuck. wizard, to the fucking guy running <laughs> Evo. Oh, man. So, um, so, so, your, your, the interview is, is quite infamous for a variety of reasons, Watson. Um, one of those reasons are your, um, are your comments on, on third strike. And so here's the thing, Watts, right? Like, yeah. maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I'm just the kind of person that's not like, you know, that's not suspicious or paranoid or whatever, but like, like I, I, I never, I never viewed you as someone like 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 when I think about all of the efforts you know you've you've made and we're going to talk more about this you know when we come back for our final segment you know and, and talk about your contributions you know after being a competitor right in terms of being a TO and 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 trying to resurrect Super Arcade but like you don't really hate Third Strike right Watts I mean come on let's let's okay let's, so let's, here's... Admit, admit it right here okay so, twenty twenty so thing about Third Strike okay like uh, okay. entry level entry level gameplay. Uh-huh. Third strike sucks, right? It's really boring. Entry level. Why is that? Because if you don't know how to do like you know nice combos, you know just even like a strong fierce fireball super with Ken, shit like that. If you don't know how to do that, you're at an entry level. And entry level third strike is just is not interesting at all. It's very boring. It's very slow. But then then you get to the super high level third strike, and I think it's really boring also because it's such a waiting match because. At that level, you got these characters that are one touch kill, right? Like Makoto, mm-hmm. you're in, you you can't you can't touch a button against these characters in so many situations, and it becomes a waiting game instead of playing Street Fighter. But I think I think uh, intermediate to semi good Street Fighter play, I think Third Strike is is suitable for that, just because you know you can pull off some fancy stuff. You can, there's a little bit more flash. You can do a little bit of, you know, just, just the normal combos are kind of cool. Like, you know, but once you learn how to do, like, you know, the Makoto fucking Kara uppercut stun, and once you learn how to do the Urian full on blockables, then it becomes a one player game. And so the super, super high level third strike is, is a shit game because it becomes a one player game. And it's all, it's, it's just a matter of, hey, let me get to the corner. Let me charge my meter and let me bust my unblockable. And it doesn't matter if you're winning 99% to 1% life, I'm going to kill you with one hit. And that's where the game doesn't become logical anymore. It becomes all waiting game. And okay, I'm just going to wait for this guy just to give me that one inch and I'm going to take the game from him. Whereas if it's a, a medium to high level or medium to intermediate to semi high level gameplay, it's, it's a good game because, you know, there's a, the, the mental game factor, the 50-50s come into play, but they won't kill you. Whereas when you get to the higher level, that one-touch kill just kind of ruins the game, in my opinion. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of like watching an X-Men Street Fighter Infinite. Like, it, it ruins the game. Like, if you, if I could but, change but the game don't... at all, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would, I would take out, I would take out the Redizzy, I would take out one-touch kill, and I think it'd be okay. And like nerf Chun Li a little bit to an extent, but. Besides that, like, 
like I said, just intermediate level to semi, semi decent, semi high level is a good game. Mm-hmm. Anything below or anything above that, I don't think it's a good game at all. But but you don't think the you know just the the, the threat of being in that situation where you could lose the round on one decision or one setup. You don't think that that adds because you, uh, even you can't doubt kind of the, the 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 general popularity of third strike, right? I mean, it's it's Evo thirty seven. You know, when people think about the FGC, a lot of people think about third strike. People still gravitate to third strike now, even though it's less people. Whenever third strike is played at mainstream FGC events, a lot of people enjoy it as far as spectators and so forth and so on. But you don't think that 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 threat, like. Gives gives the game that that level of suspense, like always, kind of knowing that you're like walking a tightrope. No, because there's a match I remember in Arizona. I went to a devastation, the first devastation, mm-hmm. and I was playing against my buddy who plays Denjin Ryu, and he's a really good player. His name's Devil X, right? He knows the Denjin Ryu setup. Mm-hmm. He knows like he knows how to do it perfectly. If he gets you in the corner, you're stunned for sure, and you lose the round, pretty much guaranteed. Mm-hmm. So people are watching us play, and for the first 30 seconds of the match, I'm just backing up and hitting low, strong charging meter with Ken. Mm-hmm. And they walk away. Like, it winds up just me and him playing, and no one's even watching us play anymore. And that's why I tell you, when it gets to the high, high level of play, it's not fun anymore, because you got to avoid the one-touch kill. Mm. And then when you're avoiding the one-touch kill, it limits you to, instead of having, like, you know, 30% of your moves viable, you're only viable to, like, 2% of your moves in certain situations or else you're going to get fucked. You don't want to take that risk. And by turning the game into such a turtley game, it's it's horrible for the, the viewer, and it's 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 okay for the player because it's real grueling, you know? But I just think one-touch kill just ruins games, you know? Like, I think it just ruins any game in general, for one-touch kill. I'm, I definitely, I, I definitely recognize that's a big divide between, because you know we, we have to we have to keep in mind that you come from, you know, like if not the first generation FGC, maybe like the second generation. Like, would you say that numbering is pretty accurate? Like, you would, like, yeah. you're probably like the very first, and and that's something I definitely have noticed. I don't know if you recall, or I don't know if you are aware, but um. There was a video that that kind of made the rounds in social media uh, a couple months ago. Uh, it was a video that was um, Daigo sort of explaining, I believe, to Nuki why he doesn't like Third Strike. Um, you know, and and and, and I, I kind of draw, I sort of recognize uh, some parallels as far as your opinion about Third Strike goes. But like as a competitor, like you were saying, like isn't it like exciting though to play Third Strike? Don't you find it like? Especially like when you're playing someone at a high, like some another high level player. Okay, so your favorite game type for fighting, right? You hold that dear to your heart. Mm. So you make a mistake in hyper fighting, and let's just say Ryu, Ryu, I jump over your fireball. Mm -hmm. I hit you with fierce, fierce fireball. You're dizzy. I'm done. I'm done. Right? Like you can kill me. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So then my biggest combo is probably Uh cross around house, standing fierce uppercut next, right? Uh huh. You're still left with like five percent, eight percent after with that. Depe- with well, depending on when you jumped over my fireball. No, I'm just saying to start off the game. If you get oh, hit to start by off the game, okay, okay. And another combo, you still have a chance to come back, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And in this game, you touch me one time. There's no. It doesn't matter how big you are. You touch me one time, I lose the round automatic. Mm-hmm. Right, like yeah. Makoto grabs you one time. You're well, but you have to you have to build a meter, which which is inevitable, right? She will she will gain the meter, but but you're talking about like a like a round, like it's not the beginning of the game, the round though, right? Like Mako- Makoto Makoto can't round, kill you. Just, like, by the time at- you go to third round, mm-hmm. if you go to third round, you're fucked, right? If Makoto has any meter, you're still screwed. Mm-hmm. Like you have no chance of even coming back. Like think about it. Akuma can't even Akuma can't even do a hurricane kick against Makoto ever, mm-hmm. or he'll die. Like, mm-hmm. that's his, one of his main special moves. If I can't even do that, then you're limiting the game and you're, you're making it where I can't do something mm-hmm. because you can punish it. And Grant is a tough punish, but a high-level player can punish it, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if I'm playing a character like Ken, you make me block a hurricane, I'll just uppercut If I'm good, I'll car uppercut you one more time and you'll lose, like, 30%. But as with Koko, I hit you one time and your game is over. Mm-hmm. Or if you even go into like super turbo, you have T Hawk. T Hawk could be losing the whole round 
and have absolutely no life left. If he makes you block one <laughs> jab, mm -hmm. SPD, and you're dead. Your whole round is over, regardless of what character you are, unless you have Kemi. Think about like how, like how broken is a game where you can just train how to do one move and win the whole game, while this guy just fucking totally kicked the shit out of you, and all you need is to get in that one little hair, and that's it, and your whole game's over. No, like, I'm not thinking he's a fuck. You know how to do it. You've been practicing that. It's pretty unfair. I think. I think it's really unfair that. There's no when there's no escape for something. I think the game is broken. And well, I mean, you know, to, to to go back to the whole Makoto one touch kill example, right? Like, you know, there's still positioning involved. Like, you can't like Makoto can't grab the opponent anywhere on the screen and land it. So there's positioning involved. So as the opponent, is it just a matter of me just going okay? I just have to. I just have to avoid the situation. Like, okay. like, yeah, you can't get out of the situation once you're in it. Well, it only has to be on 50% of her screen, right? Yeah, it has to be at a certain, oh. you know, distance. Mm -hmm. So so if you're a smart Makoto and you have a two-pixel lead, you just stay on your side of the screen, then now the game is a, a game of waiting and it's still Okay, waiting. so that, that, that I grant you, right? That I grant you. In certain situations, in, in some third strike games, it, it does ha that, that does tend to happen, right? Like, especially later on, third game, third round. You know, because, you know, neither, because sometimes there are some situations where neither opponent wants to take a risk. But, like, right. that's the beauty of Third Strike. Because, well, really, any game, because you could, any fighting game, because you could play however way you want, right? Like, both opponents don't have to turtle. One could just go in. Like, I'm sure you've seen Third Strike matches. Like, you were talking about, I don't know if we were talking about it on stream, or I think we were talking about off stream, but you had shared a story about you playing Ken I one time, right? Can, can you share this? I don't think you mentioned it on the stream. So can you share that story again? Well, Ken, I was at a family fun round bat, right? <laughs> I, I have Ken I in the corner. Okay. I throw Ken I seven times in a row. Seven times in a row I throw this guy with Ken. Hmm. On the eighth time, I do strong, fierce combo just to get a hit come from on an uppercut or anything, whatever. Just like I can back off. He fucking parries my strong fears, and he grabs me, and he wins. He, he does man grab and well, super, and but that's why you shouldn't him. have pressed those buttons. That's why you shouldn't have, you know, you should have just chilled, right, Watts? But, mean, but it's, it's a, like if you throw someone seven times, it makes no <laughs> sense. And that's why Ken I is Ken I is very special, right? I'm not gonna say he's just very special in that. I don't know. He does. He does the most retarded shit at the worst time. He and was he very unpredictable. Scared. Very unpredictable. Yeah. Like he's not scared to die. He's one of those guys that he'll put his life on the line every single game, and he doesn't care because when it finally works, he's fucking. He just has a stupid smirk on his face, and he just on a fucking smirk out of him, dude. Like you fucking idiot. Why would you do that right there? Like the whole point of Street Fighter is kind of like you train your opponent to do what you want, you know. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just it's just funny, dude. It's it's funny. Just different styles of player. And mm -hmm. Ken I is one of those where when I play against him, it's either he loses fast or I lose fast. There's no there's no point in thinking. It's like, all right, dude, I'm going in. You fucking hit me, I die. I hit you, you're gonna die. That's it. I don't give a shit, dude. It's like he's the ultimate. I don't give a shit player, dude. And, I, I can kind of respect it, but when you look at Ken I from the outside, he looks like a smarter guy. He wears glasses. He's very calm and quiet. And it looks like this guy's going to be so calculated. He's going to do, like, this perfect one-frame hit and mm -hmm. these nice-ass fucking delicate combos. But instead, this guy's like the fucking Brooklyn brawler, dude. He just fucking gets in there and doesn't give a fuck whether he wins or loses. He just mm -hmm. swings fucking haymakers left and right. And his game just does not... It does not match his his physical persona whatsoever. It's just hilarious, dude. You got to know him and you got to play against him to understand. But this guy is just, he's a very special character in the scene for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just, I think, McC I think, can I grasp something that the majority of American players didn't really grasp at the time? And that is, you know, because of the parry system, you know, because of the game mechanic, I mean, you 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 really have to 
play to your character's strengths, right? Like, like, like you grabbed him seven times in a row, but he knows what you know, right? Which is one command grab, I can win the round. Yeah, but one more so, throw, and he's there. Yeah, but, but, but you know, so you know, so, well, so why not roll the? So, but for him, why not roll the dice in that situation? But for me, it's like, and also, was, was, was it round one? Yeah, was it round assume. one? I'm gonna assume that you're gonna you might want to check the grab because one more throw and you're dead, buddy. Like, but he's not scared, dude. He's just not scared. He's not. I don't want to say he's not smart enough to be scared. He just mm-hmm. has this stupid bravery in him where this courage is just so strong that he just doesn't give a fuck about any situation, dude. It's so funny, mm-hmm. dude. Like, I laugh about it now, but I was angry back then. But I can sit here and laugh about it now and be like, ah, oh, this fucking guy, man. It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Because cause third, third Strike, especially, you know, back when we were learning the game, you know, back in the early 2000s, it really did seem like it, it, it rewarded randomness, right? Like, it really did seem like it was like, you could play super, super solid, and it just doesn't seem fair, right? Okay, you slip up once, or maybe you press a button that you shouldn't have pressed, and now you're fucked. But, it's you know, I, I, I think that's, what's the, Seroy, I think that's right? the thing. I don't know if you're familiar with this game. I know you know who he is, but Seroid plays... Mm-hmm. And he's really random on parries, right? And he was playing, like, Ryu SA2 back then. Mm-hmm. So when me and Paul Lee went to Canada, mm-hmm. we, we fully discussed it. We're like, okay, when we play, Mar- when we play Marvin, mm-hmm. after we knock him down, we just let him get up. Fuck it. There's no... Just let him get up. Stand back. Let him get up. That's his first nightmare because he doesn't really enjoy the game, but he enjoys parrying. Mm-hmm. So if we take his fun out of the game, yeah, the game's going to last a lot longer, and he's going to live a lot longer than normal, but we eliminate his stream by just playing pussy and just not doing anything. Like, it was, it was the funniest game plan that we came up with. It was, it was just too good, dude. Just don't hit anything. Let him get out. Fuck it. It doesn't matter. You trip him, back off. So before we go on our second and final break, one last question. Uh, James Chen... Jay Chansor, shout out to James Chen. Um, he's gone on record several times talking about, you know, why he doesn't like Third Strike, you know, and, and one of the things that he's said multiple times is that he's not very fond of the parry mechanism. Um, but we just got done watching you play Mester, and, um, you know, arguably, you know, the, the, the moment that turned that last game around was when, you know, after blocking most of his Ganesian, you know, he master made the mistake of for some reason putting himself in the corner, and then he I think he did like a neutral jump strong or something like that, and then you parried it into target combo. Like, what's your thoughts on the parry? Because a lot of people like it, a lot of people think it's what makes Third Strike not really a Street Fighter game. But what are your thoughts on the parry personally? I think so. I didn't play three very much, and I didn't play two I, but. From what it was to what it became was a vast improvement, right? Because in three, you could just tap down, tap forward, tap forward, you could just keep it investing and a parry or walk forward and gain ground. This one, if you miss a parry, there's like a certain amount of frames. I don't know the data or whatever, but there's a recovery. I don't know if you ever watch any of my videos, but I can tell you this. I never, ever down parry. I've never used down parry in my life. Like, I feel there's absolutely zero need for it because I play footsies. But I think parries are kind of bullshit because at that point, when he does the strong and I parry it, after I parry, I can still advance and do a strong, fierce target combo, whether or not anything happened. If he hits a button, he's vulnerable because I parry. Now he's open to a free hit. If I don't, I still get a strong fierce, even though it won't hit him. So it's like, for an offensive player, it's... It feels like it's a little strong in that mechanic for the offensive player. But as long as, as long as there's no one-touch kill from a parry, I'm okay with it. It's where Makoto gets a parry and the command grabs you or Yurian parries and launches you with Fierce and gives you the fucking unblockable RX fucking mirrors all over your ass fucking combos. And that, that's when I have a problem with it, but... It's good to keep the game momentum. The game's slow already, so it needs something to open up the player. And I think it's fine, but like I said, once it gets to the one punch kill, that's when that's when I think everything is kind of a little overpowered. Mm-hmm. 
Definitely, definitely. All right, well, guys, we're going to go ahead and take our second and final break. But when we come back, we're going to have uh, a little bit more uh, Mutant Experience podcast with my special guest, episode 50. We're doing it big today. We got our special guest, living legend, FGC, Mike Watson. Don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be back. Welcome back, everyone, to more Mutant Experience Podcasts. We have reached episode 50. Thank you so much to those of you who have been uh, following the podcast and have been uh, listening these past uh, three years. Uh, thank you again uh, for all the support. Today, uh, on a very special Sunday afternoon of the Mutant Experience Podcast, we have Mike Watson as our special guest. Watts, so um, your, 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 po- your post-playing career... Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about you know your 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 history as a TO. Um, you know one of the events uh, that that sort of stands out in my mind is uh, Evo Reloaded or uh, I, what was the exact what was the what was the official name for it Moment Thirty Seven Reloaded. Evo, what was it called? The what would you call it? The Thirty Seven Reloaded. That's it. Yeah, I think it was thirty thirty seven Reloaded. Yeah, kind of a bite off the matrix, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, how that I- idea came about? Sort of, you know, you know, the genesis of that event. So we're we're big fans of uh, the older games, obviously. That's my generation. I love uh, mm-hmm. keeping the game alive. And then it just so happened that the original Super Arcade was located, you know, not too far from Cal Poly. And what some people don't know is. 
Oh, we'll save that story for another day. There's no point talking about that. Uh, what people don't know is I have I had some uh, hookups over Cal Poly, and we could have got the same room, same everything that the actual moment 37 happened. Mm-hmm. And it was affordable at the time. And then uh, back then, Twitch was giving money to people for running tournaments and stuff. And they offered to chip in for the venue and everything. I was like, Fuck it. Let's organize this. And originally, Tomo was going to come out. Uh, wow. We were going to set up like an exhibition for Tomo and Daigo just to play hyper fighting, just for fun. You know, it's casual. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell Daigo to chill out because obviously he's in much better game shape than Tomo was. But it just would have been cool that both those guys step on the same machine at the same time. You know, it just would have been something really cool. And then uh, we got Boss to come out because he's a CBS2 world champion. Just wanted to recreate Boss coming out. Try to get Troy out. Try to get a lot of people out. But, uh, mm-hmm. The main attraction was going to be Justin and Daigo, obviously, because they were the moment 37. And uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff where uh, Daigo almost didn't come. I don't want to throw people under the bus, but it, it took a lot of work. Uh, Mark Man, Mark Man actually, uh, he was the final deciding factor in getting Daigo over here because he he uh, he committed to coming to the tournament and then he backed out and then. Mark Man made it happen in the end, the last minute, and obviously without him coming, it wouldn't have been the same. But we needed Daigo there. Uh, he didn't enter any of the tournaments, unfortunately, due to some contract stipulations or whatnot. I don't know. Just it, this, this, this whole corporate shit involved in our community is so stupid where players can't enter tournaments due to obligations. It's just, it's, it's real bullshit. It just, we're supposed to be playing for fun, playing for love of the game, and then they're not allowed to play in specific tournaments because of some bullshit. It's, it's more shit where it just makes me hate these fucking corporations where they step in, they throw money into the, the scene that's almost irrelevant, but they still try to have some control, and it's just, it's, it sucks. So as a TO, my goal was to bring back the evil experience, have everything, you know, Friendly for the, the fans, for the players. And we threw a tournament. We had Marvel 2, CBS 2, Third Strike. We threw a Street Fighter 4 on the side just to fill the place just in case. But, man, I mean, it, it was it was awesome. We had, like, 20-something CRTs. All the setups were getting played nonstop, like, even after the tournaments were over. Like, it was – if you're if you're an old-school gamer fan, it was just – it was an awesome environment. I can't – I can't describe it any better. There's video footage of it. Like, uh, I go play Justin again in Third Strike Exhibition. And, of course, of course, Justin set it up where Daigo knows he's going to super. And beforehand, Daigo was practicing pairing the super on uh, on console and stuff just to get the hang of it. And, you know, he did it again. And it was just, it was a really cool turn to do. Like, I can't explain it. It was it's just fun times, man. It's just bringing back old school feel. And people were there for the love of the game. People were there for the love of the game. The prizes were shitty. There's only like ten dollar entry fee for every prize, and I think I think we hit like I know we hit at least sixty four for every tournament, and I know Street Fighter Four had a hundred. So there was a decent amount of people for every tournament, but but Reloaded was Reloaded was a pretty cool event, and just but it was during that tournament where there was a lot of there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes that made me really, really despise, like how the corporation's trying to take over our scene and how everything turned into money, and it's just it's bullshit. Like I kept the registration real low. I think I made it like thirty dollars or something like that for a two-day tournament. Like, and people nowadays are charging like seventy dollars, fucking hundred dollars. And I don't know, man. Like I tried to do my best to keep the scene alive, keep it true to the grassroots, but I don't know. It's just, it's a real tough task. It's a real tough task. You need a lot of help and you need, you need people, you need an army of people that are willing to do it for the love of everything. And it just, people get busy. The the ones that really care, they get older, they have other obligations. The newer ones, they don't understand or they didn't take the time or they weren't around to really, to really feel like what it's like back then. So the, I don't want to say they don't respect it, but they don't know, they don't know what we're trying to achieve. So they can't really, how do you say it? they can't really coordinate and they can't really put their own love into it when they don't know what it's like to be there in the, the initial. So it's just, it's a tough, 
it's a tough thing just to try to recreate stuff like this. But I think I think that tournament, I think we accomplished what we wanted, and a lot of people have fond memories of it. I definitely do. And hey, if it happens again, it happens again. But we'll we'll, we'll keep this one. We'll keep this one close. So, um, not to, uh, not to, uh, uh, not to, uh, dig up old wounds or whatever the saying is, um, but noticeably absent at, uh, moment 37 reloaded were, uh, some of the, uh, top, uh, family fun players. Um, there was some, uh, controversy surrounding the setups for third strike. Uh, I know that this was, uh, well documented in the third strike junkies facebook uh page which is the uh resident third strike group uh on facebook um and so can can you tell us a little bit about kind of exactly how that 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 played out um from from what i from from my research and from what i read um because even though i was already part of the third strike scene i didn't really pay a whole lot of attention uh at that point um but there was um the the claim uh, that the uh, third strike was being advertised uh, as being on uh, arcade, um, and then something there was, there happened. Was no so, of so what, what it was exactly was going to be on? Uh, okay. I do remember me and Yi were in some talks, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they got to understand. Like I'm trying to organize a whole tournament here. I got to make sure all these communities are cool mm -hmm. for that kind of easy because they're just focusing on third strike. They don't, they don't think about, okay, I got to make sure CVS is cool. I got to make sure Super Turbo is cool. I got to make sure Street Fighter 4 is cool. I got to make sure MVC2 is cool. Mm -hmm. I'm running five separate tournaments. I'm taking care of all the registration. And mind you, okay, this whole tournament was legit run by four people. Four people ran basically what ran Evil back in the day. Mm -hmm. So the math power behind all this is already... I got to carry TVs and setups. I got to fucking get all the hardware myself. I have two people helping me, like, set up monitors and stuff like this. I'm making the brackets the day of the tournament all by myself on my laptop. I'm taking care of all the late registrations. Like, they, they don't understand. And, you know, I get it. They have the love for their game. But if anything, after the tournament, me and you talk, and he's like, hey, you could have asked me for help, but how do I know that, you know, like, at that point, I'm so busy doing everything. Why don't you come to me and say, hey, man, mm -hmm. let me have the third strike. And I'll be like, okay, go for it. You know, you're reputable. Go for it. If you can get all the hardware together, if you can get me eight setups, go for it. I'll make the bracket. You run the whole tournament. You're in charge of that. But when we're using our brand name, right, I got to make sure everything goes down right. And for me, getting, getting setups where I already have the gear for it, I have the monitors, I have the systems, it's much easier for me. And how do you say, like, I know it's going to get done. I don't know for sure that I can count on anyone to help me get these setups. Hey, you say you can get me eight CPS3 boards and you can help me run all this shit. How am I supposed to trust you? Like, I'm trusting you with my whole tournament here. What if third strike doesn't happen and you come to me that, oh, I'm sick, or, oh, I only got four setups, or anything like that, then I'm kind of fucked. So in my eyes, I'll run at 80% a tournament where 80% of the people are happy is better than not having a tournament at all. So I'm, I'm there to get a job done. I didn't even know, like, until at the end. Like I said, we hashed out in the end, and he's like, hey, you could have come to me. And like, like I said, though, how am I supposed to count on someone when I'm trying to, trying to run everything else? It's really hard. It's really hard. It was just a bad situation. And as a player, I feel bad. I feel bad we didn't give the third strike players the best experience because even I was a victim. I was a victim of the console third strike that that tournament. I got fucking beat up by a young non-scaling super to lose the tournament. I mean, it's kind of gross, right? Like, I don't know exactly what the damage was, but I know young just it's un completely unscaled damage on the hits in his Genijin on that version. I think it was. I think it was. Fuck, was it Xbox? I don't even know, honestly. Like. Uh, the only the only glitch I'm aware of is is the is is the lack of uh, proper scaling after Zeppo tension, but but there may have been other scaling issues on OE. Yeah, oh, like, dude, oh. I was getting mm -hmm. hurt dude, by that again. I did bad, and it was just like, ow. But but you did go on record, uh, you know, primarily on 3SJ, and did you know voice your opinion that 
you know you thought that maybe the family fun players should have still came out do you still do you still hold that opinion like they it should have came out anyway just to support the game come out if that's your game come out i'm making i'm making a huge effort my my registration fee was low now if it looked like a cash grab and i'm charging like 50 bucks a head then you could have been like man fuck Watson. i'm paying 50 dollars to play i'm trying to 30 dollars for a two-day tournament and you have setups to play on literally like 16 hours a day you have 32 hours worth of entertainment for, you know, less than a dollar an hour. You can't be. I'm giving a free T-shirt away to people that registered early. I'm pretty sure anyone that looks at it from the outside is like, okay, he's doing it for the people. Worst case scenario, you bring you bring your perfect idea of a setup, and you can play on those setups casual too, right? Like, we got Boss there, we got Daigo there. I forgot who else came down, but we had some out of town. I think Fubar Duck were there. Mm -hmm. right? we got third strike players you know like people from texas i think a couple people came down lower cow came down like it was it's it's very hard to run a tournament that's perfect for everyone when you have so many games now if third strike was the only game there that's different right now i can focus on that and now we can combine our energy and our resources and we can all make a perfect third strike tournament but that's not the case and I'm not saying I kick Third Strike to the side as a, as a sideshow, but Third Strike is one of five games that's there. It's, it's very hard to accommodate. And it's already hard enough to get, like, 30 CRT monitors, and we had all those accounted for. We had, like, eight CBS, eight Super Turbo, eight Marvels, right? There's 24 TVs already accounted for. There's only so many CRTs to go around. What else? How am I supposed to provide for you? And I have 40 monitors, like LCD monitors, we ran Street Fighter 4, we had like 20 setups, and I, and I think I had like eight third strike setups, but it was on LCD monitor with, I believe, Xbox. So it's, it's very hard to please everyone. You can never make everyone happy, but not for one minute I want third strike to believe that I did anything to them on purpose to not let them have what they wanted. I just didn't have the help, and I didn't have the resources, honestly. So mm -hmm. it was a tough situation, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's just um, kind of, a, you know, obviously hindsight is 50-50. And just kind of looking back on it now and just kind of, you know, again, I didn't attend EVO uh, or, or uh, Moment 37 Reloaded. Um, but from from what you describe and from what other people have told me about the moment, about the event, I mean, it just, it wasn't like, it, it was it was more of like an opportunity to kind of celebrate the history of the FGC, right? And to yeah. maybe perhaps you know, get some new eyes on these old games. And so, again, hindsight's 50-50. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But just kind of looking back on it, I would, I, I, I would slightly agree with you in the sense that, you know, maybe the players should have come out. I mean, obviously it's not ideal, but just kind of, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, like, like, it's almost like like this is your chance to kind of remind everyone what your place in FGC history is, right? Like because it, it seems like the whole point of Moment Thirty Seven Reloaded was let's get all the top players of all of these old school games, let's and, and let's just you know have a reunion, right? It almost it, it was almost like it was more like a reunion type event as opposed well, to like a serious care. tournament. The, mm -hmm. the history of family fun helping other people is not really a long history, right? So. If they're gonna come out and say, "Oh, we would have helped you. We would have, we would have provided setups," it's really hard for me to believe that because you guys are the ones. Family fun is you guys. You guys are the ones that always shun people, and you guys always wanted people to come to your place only, and you refuse to go anywhere else. And like, like I said, I'm cool with E, right? Like, he's he's changed over the years. He's matured a lot, and I believed him when he said he wanted to help, and that's why I told him, hey, I apologized to him, and I said, hey, I had no idea you wanted to help, you know, but had you come to me, I need at least you to come to me a week ahead. Don't come to me two days before and be like, hey, can you change it? Can you, like, I can't do that, you know, like, mm -hmm. you can't fuck over 50 guys to please five guys. It just doesn't make any sense. So, like I said, I run a tournament that 80% of the people were happy with. It's better than not running a tournament at all, and if they wanted, they could have brought their own setups. Like that's that's something they could have thought about, or they could have asked me, "Hey, 
can we bring like more setups or try to change the last minute? If you guys can get it done and you can get people to agree to it, sure, no problem. You know, majority win. But mm -hmm. was, I think he was the only one that approached me and it, it was it was a little too late. And it's really hard to organize an event and make everyone happy. That's just the bottom line. You can't make everyone happy. And mm -hmm. They don't have a good history of running well, events mm -hmm. out of town. So I can't count on them. Well, I mean, you know, again, just to play devil's advocate, you know, as someone, you know, you have this concept of a Moment 37 Reloaded planned. Um, it's going to be an opportunity for everyone to get reunited, to, you know, shed some light on the history of fighting games, uh, you know, to introduce new people to these old games. Um, you know, as someone who, who had, you know, who was part of the genesis of the idea and as someone who was going to run it, I mean, was there any thinking like, hey, maybe I should reach out to the family fun guys first or you know or did you reach out to any of them at all during no, the I, planning stage? I honestly I can't remember dude I'll tell you the mm -hmm. truth it's just it's hectic putting together a big event it's hectic and like I said I don't have a team of people to do it I got yeah I got me I got a guy that's helping me find people for the bracket and I got mm -hmm. I got Mondo that's helping me streaming and mm -hmm. that's pretty much it and I just asked James on a whim like hey can you help me commentate he's like okay fuck it and then he just came down and then Ski Sonic, he came down because I know him. I'm like, hey, I'll buy you a plane ticket. Can you come down? And he's like, fuck, I usually charge. And I'm like, dude, I can't afford that. Do you want to come down or not? I'll get you a plane ticket. He's like, okay. And it was just everybody Everybody that was there did it for the love. No one got paid to compensate. I paid my streamer, you know, just because I pay him to work for Super Arcade in general anyways. And, you know, I, I probably bought lunch for, for the couple people that helped out, but Everyone was there for the love, dude. Like, no one... Dude, I didn't make shit. Like, I legit closed down my arcade for three days to go run a tournament at Cal Poly, and I didn't make money. Like, we just did it because... Once again, we're having some uh, technical difficulties. I'm sure uh, uh, Watson will be uh, back uh, momentarily. There you go. Yeah, I don't know why Discord keeps shutting down by itself. It's kind of weird. No problem. It, w w when things get when things start to get really spicy, Watts, that's when Discord. Right. Uh oh. Right? Uh oh. Censor time. Censorship. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm we glad that to... you know. I'm glad that you and you had uh, hashed that out and, and sorted that out. I mean, again, it's it, it, it's it's a lot of history, like you said, right? You know, the, the, it was really competitive back in the day. Uh, and and so I, I think I think. I think they even kind of viewed it like I was trying to make money off of it because mm -hmm. they're like they're like the third strike central, right? And by me grabbing onto them, they're probably thinking, "Oh, you just want us to help you bring more people to enter the tournament." But they don't understand, like, "Hey, look at look at how low the venue fee is." Like, if you really look at how low the venue fee, I charge like half of what other venues charge for that tournament. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you know, now, let's talk a little bit about. Um, Super Arcade. Okay. You know, we had already we already mentioned the original one. I mean, I started going there. It's just like I don't know. I mean, like, like I think I started going there around two thousand two thousand one. You know, it was uh, I was dating someone at the time who was going to Cal Poly Pomona, and so you know, oh, that's another place we didn't really talk about, right? The Cal Poly Pomona Arcade, which was a, a nice little arcade of its own. That's when I that's right. when I really experienced like Marvel hype for the first time. Like for some reason they played Marvel a lot there, and it was, it yeah. was um, but um, Super Arcade, uh, right next to uh, it was right next to Mount uh, Mount Sac, Mount San Antonio College. Was that the college it was next to? I think. Um, yeah, Mount was Sac was right across the street from us, and yeah. then Cal Pomona was like a mile down the road. Mm -hmm. So, Super Arcade, uh, your 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 quest or your struggle. To, 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 to keep Super Arcade open, to keep, you know, some sort of remnants of the old school FGC alive for the newer generation Super Arcade has been well chronicled. Um, but I want to kind of focus on, you know, I, I don't want to rehash a lot of that stuff because I know you've talked about it a lot of times before. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, Third Strike, you know, specifically at Super Arcade because I do know, I do remember distinctly when OE first came out and OE is, is online edition, of course. When online edition first came out, um, yourself 
and Super Arcade and Gutex. I think Vi was still part of the crew, uh, of the, the group there. You guys right. started running, you know, Dirt Strike tournaments. I know Pyro would came out for for some of them. Five Star came mm-hmm. out. You know, you know who, you know, how did that come about? You know, who who approached who, or who who, who whose idea was it to start featuring Dirt Strike? Now that OE had had, had just well, come out. There was a Dirt Strike team. They still came around to play like uh, the arcade mm-hmm. cap when when the Wednesday Night Fights went down and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I would come visit Super Arcade once in a while because I guess he worked at a Cal Poly across the street or whatever. And mm-hmm. who else would come down? Like uh, Mr. Bean would come down. Uh, the Chin Brothers would come down once in a while to visit. They were cool all the time. And uh, a few other people would come down. Uh, Lugo would come visit once in a while. Just all, all like the. I like the family guys, you know, because there's no family, right? So they would come down, and then uh, mm. I remember, what, what's that guy we call him? Jesus? I forgot his name, dude. <laughs> what, Farai? Yeah, Farai would come down a little bit, and you know, just everybody would come down. It was chill. It was just like, you know, people understood, like, hey, this is it, you know? Like, this is the last system. Don Arcade. Weird, like, I think Don Arcade was kind of upset with us. For some reason, they looked at us like competition, but there was really no competition. He's all the way in, in like deep LA, you know, like off the 110 freeway, and we're all the way over here, like in between Orange County. And LA, so I don't know. There was a lot of miscommunication between Don Arcade and and myself. And stuff. It's just weird. Like, I think he's a cool guy, for the record. Don's really cool. He helped us out a few times. Loaned us some equipment, sold me some stuff. He's a really cool guy. So, if there was like hard feelings, hey man, there was nothing from my side. So, whatever it is, bro, you keep doing you and keep supporting the game, dude. It's cool. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so they, specific- they kind of stayed over that way because it's closer to the valley and it was on the Japanese set. They were happy with that. And when we were modeled, I took out all the Japanese games because they're just not, it's not friendly for customers. Like, idiots would sit on it and crack it and stuff. It just, it wasn't ideal, you know. I needed to get something beefier, so I put American cabinets with Japanese sticks, and they didn't like it, and they stopped coming. But my my customers loved it, so it's one of those things where I, I can't I can't appease them because they come like once every month, and it's just it, it wouldn't make sense, you know. And I can understand how they think I'm not trying to not trying to gain their business, but I can't I can't afford to. I can't afford to do everything they want when they don't support enough. If they came every week and they spent money, that's different, right? But they come like once a month and they don't come to our tournaments regularly. So it, it's one of those things where you can't really help the customers that don't really come to support enough. So it just wouldn't make sense in a business matter. So mm-hmm. it, it's looked that kind of weird. Yeah, I was always curious, you know, kind of what happened to those, you know, I think it was called Third Strike Revival. I don't know if it was Gutex's idea. Well, obviously, shout outs to Gutex, but um, I know he was the host of that, you know, the Third Strike revival. I think you were running tournaments during Wednesday Night Fights for Third Strike, and I was just curious why that kind of tapered off because I know you, you know, there was some really good players that were coming out. I remember Paul that he made that was like his last public appearance. Paulie, I think he commentated in one of the one of the Wednesday Night Fights. But why did that fizzle out exactly? It was just kind of the family members not coming, or just uh, or, or were there you know, other factors that. I think we got like 16 players at first, and then just get mm-hmm. down to 12, and then it's like eight, and then just people get tired of playing the same, same few players, and mm-hmm. they just died. And I remember this is when uh, fuck, what's that one guy? And he plays Yuri. He was an online player. And he started coming out a lot. Cruz. Cruz, yeah, Cruz started coming out. He was a pretty cool guy, mm-hmm. but like I said, it just it gets old when it's just like two or three players playing against each other. They might as well play wherever you know. They don't need to come to the arcade because he's not offering them. Anything when it's just they're playing their own people. <laughs> they're driving, you know, 20, 30 minutes just to play the same people they could just play at home, you know, so it didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. The game just wasn't, it didn't catch fire again, you know, I never really regained the popularity at that time. Mm-hmm. All the new players were Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 4, and that was, that was it. It was hard to get people out, man. So what happened with the Rusty Perry series? Because I know that was another thing that happened at Super Arcade, you know, especially after you you took over. But but who, who was who, whose idea was the Rusty Perry series? Because I think that was we another attempt Perry, by you guys. Perry kind of. Warfare, stuff like that. You know, we would just mess around and just do old games and stuff. It's cool, but we do it like once a month, and mm-hmm. 
it, it was what it was. We got like you know sixteen players usually, and it was cool. It was cool, but I mean, honestly, I think people got kind of tired because I was winning like all the games. <laughs> I don't think they wound up winning anymore. Man, that's kind of messed up. Mm-hmm. So, so was so- good, super terrible third strike, and I would win like everything. And I was like, fuck this guy. So, you know, I want to do uh, definitely get to some of the questions that are in the chat. But before we do that, Watson, I don't really have any clever segue planned. So we're just going to get right into it. Longtime listeners of the Mune Experience know what time it is. Usually towards the end of uh, every episode, we have uh, a segment uh, called Pack It Up, uh, in which I uh, scour the internet for some of the more unique examples of uh, third strike gameplay. Uh, you are a sports fan, Watts. You, you follow basketball, so you may be familiar yeah. with Shaq and the Foo. Well, well, think of this as a third strike Shaq and the Foo. Uh-huh. Or Shaq and the Foo, right? Um, you know, th- th- that's kind of what Pack It Up is. And so we're going to have uh, five nominees, and then, um, you know, everyone gets to choose uh, who they think should win uh, this episode's uh, Pack It Up moment. So, uh, are you ready, uh, Watson, uh, for your first ever pack it up? Let's do it. All right. So, without further ado, everyone, uh, here is uh, this episode's uh, edition of Pack It Up. All right. Here we go. Shout outs to Dirt Master for the uh, dope theme beat for Pack It Up. Chicago Third Strike player. Best Chicago Third Strike player, arguably. All right, so clip number one from your old friend, J.R. Rodriguez, Pikachu Akuma. And so Big Black tries to <laughs> does a really good job of blocking the Brave Dance, but then doesn't punish correctly. <laughs> so, it's pretty funny. Shout outs to J.R. Still streaming, it appears. Uh, nominee number two. Well, that's a hell of a racist pick, dude. Uh, Watson, wow. <laughs> I, mean, I guess when, when I don't know what this Chun was trying to do, <laughs> maybe trying to get a full punish or something, <laughs> and uh, just kind of decides not to uh, not to stay on the ground. I don't really know what happened there. <laughs> All right, so nominee number three. Um, you know I get you know wanting to build meter right, what? But. <laughs> I mean, he ended up winning the round, to be fair, but, like, let's see. <laughs> I, mean, he's not, I don't even know if he's mashing. I don't even know if the Makoto player was mashing out of Dizzy. That was, uh, that was pretty funny. Uh, yeah, nominee number four. Yeah, you know, not a good look. <laughs> I mean, some attempt times when you play Third Strike online, Watts, you get these uh, interesting reads. And, uh, meter, dude. <laughs> All right, so nominee number five. Like I was on, I was on the edge of my seat for this clip because I had no idea who was gonna win. I don't know if you can guess, Watts, but I mean, I just, I like just at the very moment. <laughs> I just, I had no idea. I, I had never seen this situation before. I really thought that 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 the wake up super would have worked, but I, I guess not. Um, you know those startup frames. So um, pretty, pretty, pretty funny. So that's uh your five nominees. What do you think, Watson? What's your uh, what's your favorite? Uh, I'm gonna vote nominee? for. Uh, I'm gonna vote for number three just because you're going the third round with no meter with Akuma. It's kind of stupid. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So once again, guys, stupid move. It's like a combination, like the levels of stupidity are. Mm -hmm. It's like three layered at that point. It's not even like one stupid move in a brain fart, dude. It's like you're just an idiot to do something like that. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes third strike games can happen that way. So Watts, let's go ahead and get to some of these questions that are in the chat. Let's go. Um, I know you're a busy man, so I wanted to get through them real quickly here. So, uh, Pertho asks, um, you know, what are your, some of your, uh, oh, well, well actually, uh, first question comes from Mount Sack Kid, Christian. I don't know if you remember Mount Sack Kid. That's course, a name that you might true. remember. But, um, yeah, he, he was a big third strike head back in the day as well. So, uh, so Christian asks, um, 
what is the best Chinese spot in Monterey Park? I mean, that, that we can have a we can have an entire podcast about Chinese food in Monterey Park. I mean, to be honest, right? So this is this is a pretty tough question. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, say that again, Watson. Sorry, you're 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 breaking up again. Yeah, sorry, Watson. You're just breaking up again. Uh, go, uh, repeat it again. Yeah, let me uh let me see if I can uh maybe just reconnect and disconnect. See if we can get it uh see if we can get a little better connection. Okay, go ahead. So once again, guys, just uh bear with us. We're having some technical difficulties here. So 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 um so Watson said Mama Lou's dumpling house. Is that the current Spot to go to in Monterey Park right now, Watts? Yeah. I heard dumpling, dumpling endeavors. Okay. Okay. And there, so you can get it delivered to the mm -hmm. so, so here's another question from the chat. Um, what are some of your favorite characters to play in, in, in all Street Fighter games and why? Alpha One, I love this guy. That's the only version of guy. Uh, like the guy Alpha One. Um, really fast pace, all up in your ass. So I'm can you repeat sure that again? Sorry. So, off, who, who, alpha counter. Who who did you use in Alpha again? Can you repeat that again? Which character? Uh, guy. Guy, guy, right? You know, you know who else is a really big fan of Guy? This is, this is a name that you probably haven't heard in a while. But Flash Gordon, John Gordon. Oh, I know Flash. Dude. My, my buddy from New York, man. He's a big, he's a big, I see him using Guy a lot too. Alpha 1, people didn't like it, but it's one of my favorite games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Really what are some other characters? Uh, Hyper Fighting Ryu. I guess, uh, you remember back in the day, dude, everyone played Ryu Ryu, right? All the fobs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like 90% like of the matches in Street Fighter were Ryu Ryu in the mm -hmm. arcade. 90%. Hmm. Wow, okay. All right, so let's get another question. Uh, so this is from Theologian. Um, Mike, w w would you ever consider making a com comeback? Competitive Street Fighter comeback? It's like, tough, I, I, I can only I'm assume that gonna... he's talking about like SF5 or maybe a modern game or whatever. Believe it or not, I'm going to fucking practice Marvel 2 pretty soon mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. just for a few matches. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. If that brings back some competitive... Competitive drive, maybe, but the money in Marvel Two is kind of fun right now, and you got a lot of people willing to bet that aren't very good. Well, I, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit salty here because you know Marvel Two, y'all got Michael B. Jordan, dude, that's playing, pretty sick, playing right? Marvel versus Capcom Two, dude. Where are the celebrities who play Third Strike? I mean, come on, let's let's. You know? If you, you know? if you are a celebrity, okay. Like either like like you don't even have to be on the level of a Michael B. Jordan, okay? If you are like Third Strike, will take the B level celebrities. We'll, we'll take the <laughs> we'll take the B listers, okay? You can um, get like Rift Track playing it or something or a Little <laughs> Beast. Did Jamie Lee Curtis say she thinks Third Strike is the best? <laughs> no fucking way, dude! Doesn't she like Cammy? I heard she likes Cammy in Street Fighter Four. Yeah, yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so, uh, Pertho asks again, what are some of the, uh, he asks, what are some of the glaring mistakes you see in new players? I don't know if this is a specific game yeah. or, you know, mental toughness, mental toughness, mental toughness, dude. Mm. They have no fucking mental toughness. They can perform all these fucking sick ass combos. They fucking spend hours and hours in the fucking training room. But when it comes down to just a little bit of pressure in a situation, they fucking crack, dude. It's just, you're just like, what the fuck? You like to all this bullshit, but in the middle of a scramble, you shit your pants, and it's like, dude, that's not gonna, that's not gonna generate many victories, dude. You need mental toughness. Don't so, shit your pants, dude. Don't get scared. Mm -hmm. So someone might say, you know, in response to that, Watts, well, you know, you guys never played 
with the kind of stakes that we play or you guys never play, you know, in the crowds that we've played before. And what do you respond? How do you respond to that? You never played with a fucking knife on your fucking back. I never played with a guy who had a gun in his pocket next to him that's ready to shoot you. You never fucking, <laughs> you never had to deal with fucking, if you step outside after the match, you're going to get jumped by fucking 10 fools. You never dealt with that shit. So I don't want to hear anything about pressure, dude. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, good, good, good response. Good response. So, um, uh, let's see some other, uh, I know that, um, Neiman had a question earlier in, in, in the chat, um, kind of a, a touchy little question here. He had asked, you know, whether or not you remember any, um, moments of, uh, T.O. chicanery in third strike history. Like, so is that, is that Neiman? What up Neiman? Is that Neiman? Yeah, Neiman's uh, in the chat right now. But I did I, I believe he did ask earlier in the podcast whether you remember any um TO irregularities back in the day Man. when it comes to third strike tournaments. <laughs> there's there's one fucking guy, right? I don't know I don't want to name his name because it's fucked up, but Oh no. Everyone will know who I'm talking about. Okay, okay. This guy would always make himself place like top four or five. He would run the brackets, and he knows who he can and can't beat. And he can beat some of the good players, but there's certain good players he can't touch ever. Now, now you're talking about a SoCal player. SoCal player, family fun ran back, okay? Oh. Always placing top four or five, always putting himself up against people he knows he can beat. Even if it's a good player, he knows he has their number, but he'll never play the guys that he knows can beat him. Never, never, never. Yeah. And now, is this proven fact? No. But if you look at the history and if you go back and look at the brackets, you'll notice he doesn't face certain people for a reason. So I'm pretty sure you know who it is. I'm, I have no idea who it is. Maybe Who's I'm just innocent. Like Who knows exactly who I'm talking about? But 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 maybe we'll give uh, we'll give uh, we'll give the scene something to talk about. You know, and people will start guessing who. Uh, who they think it is because I, I have no idea. Shit, um, talking about if you want to be in my videos, you won't have to see your dad's up all on stage. <laughs> so Neiman uh, uh, had another question about Super Arcade um, as far as, you know, again, I didn't want to rehash too much because I know you've said it a lot, but just kind of briefly, can you kind of tell us how that came about, like the decision to help out Super Arcade and then eventually to buy the rights to it and then... Okay, so here's the story with Super Arcade. Mm -hmm. Family fun owner Ralph uh, was approached by the owner of Super to purchase it, and then uh, that owner also owned the arcade inside uh, Yalhan Plaza in downtown, which was uh, on the second floor. I forgot what it was called, dude. It wasn't... Fuck, what was that arcade called? I don't remember, but the people that owned Super also owned the arcade inside the uh, Japanese town plaza, Yalhan. And it was sold as a package deal, um, I think they were just tired of it, dude. They weren't making money. They kind of lied to Ralph about the revenue and stuff, and the revenue really wasn't there. And then, uh, this is when uh, Black Friday on poker happened. And this is when the Department of uh, Justice shut down online poker, which was my source of income. I was making, you know, I was making over 100, 120K a year on online poker. It took away, it took away that from me, so I had to find something to do. So I wound up, uh, I wound up getting called by Ralph, and it was perfect timing. It was just really perfect timing. He's like, "Hey, you want to uh, want to check this arcade out? Maybe you can, you know, do your magic over here, run some tournaments and stuff." I was like, "Oh, let me check it out," you know. And during the time, I was still talking to Hawaii. I would go support his tournaments every once in a while. Like he would be at random spots, like at, near the airport, like at a hotel here or the Proud Bird or whatever it was. He would be at random spots and come out to show some love, you know. Then I called up. I'm like, hey, bro, you want to bring that shit over here? And then, dude, a phone call and a handshake later. And, dude, WNF was brought to Super. And everything was cool in the beginning. You know, we had a lot of players. We had a lot of people coming down playing the arcade games. Revenue was cool. But then uh, the owner had a, what do you have? He had some kind of cancer. And then uh, he just, it, it's just a tough travel to come to Super every day from the valley to, like service stuff, stuff, and I wasn't really experienced back then. This is my first ex experience in arcade, being like you know working and being with tech and everything. So I was still learning at the time. And then uh, he kind of gave up. He's like, "Hey, we're done. You want to buy it off me?" And 
there was some drama involved with that, and I don't want to blow up anyone's spot, but water's on the bridge now, it's fine. But he had to do what he had to do, and I took over super. Uh, kind of had to start from scratch. Everything was taken from from uh, out from under me, so we just figured it out, and then uh, we ran super, built it up slowly, did a Kickstarter, bought a lot of machines, wound up having to move because uh, the landlord thought we had Dude, the landlord thought we were making fucking a gang of money. They'd see 100 people there every night, and they're like, oh, we're going to raise your rent. It was already 6000 a month. And they wanted me to sign a three-year lease and raise the rent to like 8000 And it was like, dude, it's ridiculous. So we moved to Azusa, ran into a lot of trouble over there at the city, and finally opened. You know, like I said, we keep promises. I can't do it with my promise. We just can stay open forever. Just the money wasn't there, you know, and I was grinding my life away. Uh, Lucky we closed down when we did, because then COVID hit, you know, not too many months after that. And, you know, just shut it down. Who knows in the future, though? I'm thinking about maybe maybe starting a barcade sometime soon or something, but who knows? Everything is just up in the air right now, because no one knows what's going to happen in the next few months or even the next year or so. So, mm-hmm. see what happens. Well, you know, speaking of the future, Mike, you know, obviously, you know, I wish you uh, all the best in your future endeavors. Um, I know someone in the chat had mentioned uh, maybe the possibility of you opening a barcade. You know, maybe that's the, maybe that's maybe the direction that that we have to take as far as the old school FGC. Who knows? But um, before we get out of here, Mike, what would you want your legacy in not just the FGC but Third Strike in general to be? Because again, you know, we've. You know, this is probably the longest podcast I've done. You know, episode 50. We had to do it big. There was so much stuff we had to get through. Um, and so, you know, w- what would you like your Third Strike legacy to be? Like, you know, when, when people think back on Mike Watson as far as Third Strike, American Third Strike is concerned, uh, you know, you aside from beating Mester, <laughs> what, what you would you like to, your legacy to be? You don't have to play the game how anyone else plays it. Like, legit. I never down parry. I really think I dumbed down the game to the point where I made it as basic as possible. I played footsies with everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, I took away the 50-50s. So I kind of I kind of feel like I changed the game, not advancing it, but I kind of I kind of brought it back old school in a sense and I just dumbed the game down and whatever it takes for you to win, regardless, just play to your strengths. And I played to my strengths, you know, being basic, being technical, eliminating 50-50. And I just made it, I made people play the way I wanted to play. And I think, I think you can do that in life, you know, just make things easier for you. Take advantage of your strengths and just, you can do that in almost anything. And I think, uh, like I said, I don't play third strike like anyone else. So I think I kind of, I didn't revolutionize the game, but I changed the game in that sense where I can still win at a game by eliminating like 80% of the system that was instilled into the game. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, 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 you know, obviously I only speak for myself, but uh, before we get out of here, I just wanted to thank you, Mike, for uh, all of the uh, third strike memories that you were responsible for, you know, just personally coming up in the scene. Again, you know, a lot, a lot. Your 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 history with the third strike scene is uh <laughs> is very unique <laughs> and and very varied. But um, you know, just just from my personal perspective, um, you know, just again from your moment meeting beating Mester, you know, just to your rivalry with Family Fun. I mean, it was a lot of great memories. It was it was really awesome, awesome stuff. And so, uh, once again, before we get out of here. Uh, please uh, follow Mike. Um, you know, is there anything you wanted to plug before we get out of here, man? You know, the floor is yours. Hey, we're gonna start a. We're gonna be starting a. Probably start streaming in a couple weeks uh, after Thanksgiving. If you guys want to check it out, we're just gonna be going over the history of games. Mm-hmm. The, history of the Street Fighter scene, straight from my mouth, so you know it's real. No fucking watered down bullshit. Tell you how it was like growing up. Mm-hmm. Tell you behind the scenes stories of Evo, behind the scenes stories of all your favorite players that you thought you knew and who they really are, and just sharing mm-hmm. sharing a lot of fun stuff, a lot of fun stories. You know, I got 25 years of stories to share with you guys. Mm-hmm. Just come join us, and we'll have segments where you know maybe we'll teach you guys a little bit of the fundamentals for those who are in- interested, and 
just just keep it lighthearted, you know, keep motivational. Just try to keep everyone happy during these crazy times. And come join us if you can, man. Keep an eye on my Twitter for updates. And uh, yeah, we'll be reaching out to you real soon. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting Mutants Podcast. Even though the game's not my favorite, hey, you're keeping a game alive and you're doing something. Just keep the games alive, keep playing, keep having fun. That's what it's all about. Okay. And so, but you got to do one last thing for me. What? <laughs> you got to admit, live on podcast, I don't want you to tell me that you love Third Strike, but you got to at least say that it, it really doesn't suck. I mean, compared to a lot of other games. You got you got to say it for me, Watts, because I know you don't think it really, really sucks. So, so I'll have two more things to say before I go. Okay. As soon as I say them, I'm on my camera, and I'm going to be done with this. Besides saying thank you again to everybody, I'm going to say, no bullshit. Third Strike is, is kind of ass. <laughs> Fuck you, Mr. Wizard. <laughs> well, there you go, Mike Watson. Thank you guys for tuning in, and uh, I'll see you guys uh, on the next Mean Experience podcast. Thanks for tuning in to episode 50. See you guys later.